Good day to everyone all over the world, wherever you are. I am retired rap artist Mike Jones, who is now become a YouTuber. Although I don't look the same I did in the rap videos from 20 years ago, I assure you that's clearly me. Today I am joined by Eric Manning of Testify, Rob of Sentinel Apologetics, and unfortunately a Canadian snuck in here. I apologize for that. He claims he is from Wisconsin, which is just uh, South Canada, as we all know. But I also have fan of exploring reality. How are you doing today, Mr. Canadian, sir? I'm doing very good, yeah. Yeah, don't you know? That's my don't attempt you know. at a Canadian accent. <laughs> so, all right. So, today we are going to be going over uh, the very famous video that sort of has been going viral lately, Satan's Guide to the Bible. And so I have got numerous requests from hundreds of followers to respond to this. About a month ago, Than was like, we should address this. And I was like, yeah, put a team together, Than. So that's what we did. Uh, so we got a pretty awesome team here. Uh, so let's start by just talking about our general thoughts of the overall video. Uh, Rob, why don't you start us out? What were your thoughts with the video? To be honest, I, I don't... Wait. Oh, you're 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 peeking like crazy, Rob. All right, Here. fix your mic, Eric. You go first, then we're gonna go to Rob. Mike is not... Yeah. Um. I thought. Gosh, I don't. How do I sound? Not too negative. I'll just sound negative. I thought it sucked. Um. <laughs> so, um. I mean, it's just. I just got to be honest, right? And so uh, I'm told not. To, you know, by counter apologist, to quit sugarcoating it and faking smiles and all this other stuff. No, but seriously, I thought it was bad. Um. I just. Even if I was sympathetic. Like, let's just say I was an atheist and and I, I was sympathetic to the points that are being made by the scholars that are on the video, which the scholars themselves weren't really the problem with the video. The problem with the video is that it's an hour and a half long and there's only about 20 minutes or less of con of substance. Yeah. That's the problem that I had with it. It just was very ham fisted, too much attempts to try to be funny. Um, there was a lot of kind of ad hominem crap like you know, pastors are keeping secrets from you. They would just want to keep their jobs. They're trying to hide things from you. And I'm thinking my pastor doesn't know any of this stuff. He's a good guy. Like, why are you just like blanket accusing pastors of hiding things from you? Um, th th it just totally ignores that, you know, a lot of seminaries actually do do a good job of addressing these things. And frankly, the pastors just aren't bothered by them. And so they're not going to like bring them up with their congregation. So I didn't like the mm. su suspicion that they're trying to throw out there the, the kind of the shade that, well, you're just committed to inerrancy kind of nonsense. Yeah. If you take out all that fluff and then you just talk about the arguments, then it's just scholars basically kind of reading out of their books, the same standard stock objections that you, Mike, um, that, that you, Rob, that you, Than, uh, and myself have been answering over and over and over again. Um, maybe it's a good introduction to people who haven't heard these things before, but it's so one-sided that it's not really a good introduction. It just comes across, mm -hmm. I'm sorry to say it, Mike Winger's right, propaganda. Yeah. So, Yeah, why don't you uh, try again, Rob? Let's see if your mic's working. How's that? That's a little better, but you're still blowing it out. Turn that down. Wait, 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 wait. All right. This is ridiculous. You can try to um, lower hour. it. You can try to lower it now. manually. There you go. You're making the Canadian look good. This is ridiculous. <laughs> this, this is this is Aussie internet. Don't forget. So there you go. All right. What are your thoughts, Rob? Yeah, I I agree with Eric, but I want to also be a little bit nuanced. Um, some of the scholars on there, like Hector, for example, and Collins, those are the only two I actually do respect. Uh, Collins, obviously, with his little sassy, salty comments like, uh, I hope the Canaanites appreciated the honor in regards to, like, uh, uh, again, that polemic in, in the way the documentary is made about, say, the killing of the, the Canaanites and all that. But I suspect that um, it's cherry picked. So those interviews are cherry picked. Don't forget, I. The guy who made the documentary, there was a previous documentary he made on Harold Camping on the 2011 predictions that it, that came and went. Mm -hmm. And now he's released this documentary, which is like 10 years since his last documentary. And it seems to hone in on, I guess you didn't know about this, ladies and gents. Like, for example, it starts with Satan as an adversary, not the <laughs> devil. It's like, okay, um, 
there are evangelical scholars in the field, which ironically is the point of what the documentary men mentioned, you know, critical scholars are also evangelical. They're the ones coming up with this data. So you're, pre you're presenting Satan as a critique of a Bible, of the Bible and the, and the content, uh, masking it with a, a sense of, oh, all Christians are unaware of these details, and yet it's the evangelical community that has been at the forefront in establishing these institutions. For example, Kip is in the stream right now. So Kip had the the privilege of working under, say, Peter Flint. And in fact, he was very close with Peter Flint in the Dead Sea Scroll uh, context. I'm a avid reader of his work, loved his work. Uh, he was a very brilliant individual, very nice human being as well, uh, conservative when it comes to the faith. Yeah. And what, so is, is, is someone like Peter Flint or now the late Mike Heiser? Mike, today is actually his, his birthday. Uh, he, his, his death anniversary is coming up on the 20th. These are men who had a reverence for the faith. They, their character matched with what they believed. And at the same time, they had a reverence for the academic pursuit of how to do things in a scholarly context, right? So yeah. well, hmm. Christians are not just, you know, you know, the so-called amateurs of the academic context, especially when it comes to the humanities in the humanities section of the library. Now, obviously, we're venturing into like pulling in things from a psychological perspectives and maybe neuroscientific perspectives. And now we are obviously utilizing physics concepts like radiocarbon dating and so on to, to further understand the ancient past, not just based on text and so on. So anyway, the, right. I'm, I'm spitballing a lot of like, yeah, let's, let's and, move along. Come on. Yeah. Rob. Yeah. 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 <laughs> Sam, okay. so, uh, give so us that's, your that's my thoughts. Yeah. yeah. Um, there's not much left to say other than like what Eric and Rob both said. Um, I, would, I, I kind of agree with everything here that both of them are saying. Um, the main thing that just was, it was really frustrating to watch, I think, because mm -hmm. um, it wasn't even so much the one-sidedness that bothered me. It was the mockery that came with it. Um, yeah. That that was what bothered me a lot because I, I'm one of those people that really, and, and Kip knows this about me too, um, because I've talked to him, like I'm somebody that actually really does care about the data, and I want to read everything I can from all sides of the angles I can to actually figure out what do I believe about the Hebrew Bible. And the the frustrating part about this, for me at least, was that it portrays evangelicals and pastors as people that are not worthy of your trust because they're hiding all the data, while at the same time presenting evangelicals as the people that are presenting this data, and then somehow making these implicit tacit arguments that like Christians don't need the Bible or Christ, like the Bible's not real. Oh, whatever you want to say. Right. I, I don't want to say what they're really implying, but they're implying something negative about the Christian faith. It seems like through all this. And that's the part that I want to call propaganda. It's not the one sidedness around any of that stuff. It was mm -hmm. the mockery that came with it. That made, that just makes you feel like, Hey, you're an idiot. If you disagree with any of this. Yeah, um, it was a, uh very ivory tower i i sensed a lot of projection in it quite honestly people often accuse others of the very things they're guilty of and you see that throughout there they constantly in the documentary put in jesus's mouth their caricature of jesus oh these atheist scholars they're just biased they're out to serve satan and so it's like they'll say that we're accusing them of that meanwhile throughout the documentary he's constantly accusing christians of being evil biased uh hiding scholarship just downright stupid so he's he's accused he's saying putting in the word mouth of his caricature of jesus that all these caricatures that he thinks are thrust upon him meanwhile he's caricaturing christians throughout the entire documentary he's saying we're hiding scholarship uh but quite frankly i mean i'm sitting here going no evidence for the exodus like oh but we're not going to mention kenneth kitchen or james hoffmeyer i mean to say there is no evidence for the exodus is absurd. You can say the evidence that's presented for the Exodus is insufficient, but scholars have presented evidence for the Exodus, which we will cover here. To say otherwise is just a total misrepresentation of the actual playing field right now. So 
I sensed a lot of projection, just seeing a lot of the accusations being thrown out against Christians. Meanwhile, that's what they were doing. So I found it quite demeaning, quite ivory tower mentality. Like we're up here, you dumb Christians down here. And then they expect us to come to the table and not feel frustrated and like we're being cast out or talked down to. It's just the same story we get all the time when it comes to this kind of crap. So yeah, I got asked by numerous people to respond to that. And uh, here we are. So you guys want to dive right in? Any other questions before we go? Just I'm ready to go. Clarification, how's my mic now? That's much better. Really Rob. good. Took you long <laughs> okay. enough. All right. <laughs> Sorry. All right. So as, as Eric said, rightly, there is a lot of fluff in this. So we made time markers for your own safety. So when I hear the singing over and over again, the jokes that quite frankly were sometimes landed, sometimes didn't land. Uh, but yeah, we're just going to play some of this stuff, respond to parts of it, and move along because there's a lot of fluff. No fighting. I'm here to reveal peacefully hidden Bible mm. secrets. Bible secrets? None of us will believe your secrets. The Bible says you're the father of lies. Yeah. You Again, lie. that's him, not me. I rebuke you, Satan. Thanks, Jen. Noted. There are, of course, other witnesses to these Bible secrets. One of the witnesses everyone here trusts. Who? Your pastor. Pastor Mark knows these Bible secrets too? He does. Like lots of pastors, he learned a bunch of Bible secrets at seminary. And he won't share them with us? He's keeping secrets. That's not fair. <laughs> are there any pastors that went to seminary that will share the Bible secrets? There are, but they're not called pastors. They're called biblical scholars. Where can we find them? Surprise! I brought them with me. The best. That right there is the first time. I, when I yeah. first watched this documentary, I turned it off there. I'm like, I don't have time for this. I mean, <laughs> how, how many times are I going to bring this book up? This guy's been debunked so many times through and through. And the fact, the fact that he comes up so much in this documentary was like, so many times. And most famous biblical scholars are standing by live to answer your questions. They'll tell us what Pastor Mark learned in seminary? They will. The biblical scholars will tell you the Bible secrets. Oh, wow. Wow. I All right. Let's let's stop right there. I think we wow. basically got the point. Wow. Okay, this is, this, this is what I was talking about. You know, <laughs> quite frankly, there's a sense of irony here. The, the, the documentary is aptly named Satan's Guide to the Bible. Okay, <laughs> the father of lies is going to tell us about the Bible. So... Right off the bat, it's this caricature, this utter lie. You know, when we get to Psalm 137 later, the first person who ever gave me a reasonable explanation for that was a youth pastor. I remember talking about the whole baby smashing thing, and I'm like, how do you? He gave a really reasonable explanation. It's just kind of weird to say that this stuff is being hidden when Christians are literally handing out Bibles for free. We're not hiding out Bibles with that have been marked up with like permanent marker. Yeah, I I I for I, I don't know if I'm the norm here, but like I go to a church where we explicitly do this kind of stuff. I have a class that I'm teaching to a bunch of adults, for instance, literally talking about the synoptic problem and explaining the interdependence and explaining all these different theories of that different scholars come up with, and then telling the audience that I'm teaching, here's all the arguments for these positions, here's the arguments against these positions. You decide for yourself and how that fits mm -hmm. into your faith. This is how it works. Like, that's a very normal thing that we do at, at my church. Um, I don't know if we're an exception, but the point is... No, I, not in my we do this. I do it at my church. I've done it at past churches I've been to. I've, I've been to very, very few churches. Now, I'm sure there are churches out there that do it, but I mean, like, it, is there any evidence that they are the exception of the rule or are they the general standard? Like, can we get some actual evidence or are we just going to do this faulty generalization nonsense? Yeah. I mean, to me, I, I just thought like, because oh, Bart comes in later on, on this segment that we're kind of skipping past, which is totally fine, where he's just kind of slyly suggests like, well, you know, your pastors don't want to tell you this because they don't want to give you a crisis of faith or something. And, they, you know, it, it could stir up problems and they worry about their own job security and their, their own health benefits. And I'm thinking like, I think a lot of pastors could probably make a lot more money, <laughs> probably not <laughs> pastoring, you know, like, if you oh. could do but like, what are, what are we talking about here? Like, they're just like selfish. They're just after their own interests, their own health insurance. I'm like, health insurance. What is, where, where is the, the, the pastor's health insurance thing? Like, this is like, usually they have to pay more 
because <laughs> like it's not like they're working for a large company, you know, that's subsidizing all this stuff. And so I don't know. I just thought it was kind of strange. And I'm thinking like, Bart, like, dude, you literally went to class and were classmates with Greg Boyd, who is like not just an excellent biblical scholar in his own right, but is mm-hmm. a pastor of a large church in in, in the Twin Cities in, in Minnesota. Um, and so it's like, he's not hiding any of this stuff. Like he brings it out in front of his congregation. Um, he has, he's definitely talked about things like the Canaanite stuff and all that other stuff that people, um, that they're going to bring up in this documentary. And so I'm just like, dude, like, you know, I understand, like Rob said, maybe some of this is edited. Um, maybe Bart, you know, in a one-on-one conversation would be like, oh yeah, there are some pastors that say that. But the way that this is portrayed um, is just obviously a, a huge caricature. Yeah. All right. Let's uh, let's move on here to this. We'll start getting into their arguments against biblical reliability. We're going to start with evidence for Exodus. And I want to play this out for a little bit just so we can get the actual argument here. Because I think this is the section, but there's a shift of language here, which I think was a little deceptive, even if, I, even if it was unintentional. Let's play this out. And now a reading from Dr. Hendel. As a story of deliverance from oppression, the birth of freedom, the Exodus story has served as a paradigm for over two and a half millennia. Paradigm. Liberation. And freedom. God acting in history. So the Bible says. But what do biblical scholars say? There is no archaeological evidence that would support an idea of a historical large-scale exodus from Egypt. The exodus from Egypt never happened? He's a Berkeley professor, Michelle. They're all liars there. There's no archaeology evidence for the exodus? Out of Egypt, they did not come. All right. So this is what I was talking about here. So notice the shift of language. Now, when Ron, when Dr. Hendel said that, I was like, okay, yeah, large scale. I mean, Kenneth Kitchen would agree with that probably. I mean, he argues that the numbers are either hyperbole or just been misunderstood. But then we get to the the actual like voices in the documentary talking and it it becomes, there's no archeological evidence. There's no evidence. And this is repeated throughout the documentary. There's no evidence for the Exodus. But Dr. Hendel said there's no evidence for this large scale Exodus, which Someone like James Hoffmeyer, Kenneth Kitchen might agree with that terminology, but then that's translated into no evidence at all. And that is, again, repeated throughout the documentary. So there seems like there was a shift of terminology there. Uh, when I heard Dr. Endel talk, I was like, okay, yeah. But then when I heard the documentary voices talking, like, that eh, was a little deceptive there. Uh, there is evidence for the Exodus that has been presented by Egyptologists, biblical scholars, to say otherwise it is just not accurate. So uh, let me uh, pull my slides up here because I'm going to start here. All right. This is something I I put together called Exodus Rediscovered, which is a documentary. Uh, Here's one of the slides from the documentary, the evidence that we cover for the biblical Exodus. Now, as I say in the documentary, none of these by themselves would individually support an Exodus. It's about a cumulative case. These are like pieces of chain mail working together. Okay. So we see, for example, the city of Avaris populated by Semites in uh, to about the Ramazide period, then it's abandoned. And then uh, about 40 years later, uh, we see a population explosion in Canaan towards the end of the late Bronze Age 2B. So city of Avaris, Semites residing there, no pig bones. It's abandoned during the Ramazide period. And I quoted Manfred B. Tech in the documentary series to show that. About 40 years later, towards the ends of the ends of the Bronze Age, getting close to the Bronze Age collapse, it's been abandoned. Or all of a sudden we see a population explosion, which I even, I believe I cited like people like William Deaver and Israel Finkelstein in the documentary. There was this population explosion. Then I respond to their objections to that. But we also see things like the Mount Ebal site uh, that's built around the same time. Now, some will say it's on the wrong side of uh, Mount Ebal. Problem is that Joshua never says it has to be on the side facing Mount Gerizim. It just says it has to be on the mountain of Ebal. Ebal. So we have a, a site up there. We have, for example, the latest reports on Jericho do not confirm Joshua, but they actually have been, they don't actually debunk the whole uh, conquest story like it was previously thought. The actual latest data from Lorenzo Nigro seem to fall quite coherent with what we would expect. Uh, there's some issues there with, of course, site leveling and erosion that are uh, sort of skewing the data. 
We also see Hazor. We see Shiloh is resettled. We see numerous correlations in the archaeological record that are aligning with the Exodus story. Are any of these uh, airtight, nailed down proofs of the Exodus? No, that's not how history works. But we do have evidence. So just to go through this, again, Israel's in Avaris. It's abandoned. Okay, we see that they were tasked with making bricks. We see evidence that slaves were used to make bricks in there. Okay, we see that about 40 years later, there's a population explosion in Canaan. Uh, Israelite brings a new culture into the region, which we'll get to later in this. Uh, we see brand new Israelite settles that lack pig bones. Shiloh's resettled. Joshua builds an altar in Mount Ebal. Uh, Joshua places a, uh, or there could very well be a Joshua placing a standing stone in Shechem at that period. Numerous cities were said to be conquered and line up with it. We'll get to that later because they'll say, well, they were not destroyed. Okay, but let's look at the actual language of Joshua. We see actually a lot of pretty good archaeological evidence. So to say there's just no evidence is just not accurate. There is a good case that can be made for the Exodus. And I would say it's most likely when you line up all the data to support an actual historical Exodus. Now, do we think that it was actually 4 million Israelites that came out of Egypt? No. And even if you go back to reading Hoffmeyer, Falk, Kitchen, they don't say that either. So there's a lot of data that is just sort of being ignored that supports, I would say, an exodus in this. Anything you guys want to add? If you do, unmute. If not, we're going to just move on and get to some other important I, parts. Go ahead, Rob. Yeah, I would love to um, say something about Handel himself. Yeah. So in the five years book that came out on Exodus, Hoffman and Handel were contrib contributors to that volume. Mm -hmm. um, now, when Handel made his, um, you know, like a cultural memory sort of argumentation, Hofmeier says this in regards to Handel, and this is public. This is not some like background stuff going on, some sort of drama going on. This is actually a big thing that happened. So Hofmeier says, Handel is well positioned to write the Exodus's cultural memory as his contribution to his volume. He has advocated this approach for two decades now. I'm grateful that he sees some form of historical memory in the Exodus narratives, although how he decides what is historical poses a serious problem. However, before Handel defines and develops his thesis and explains how cultural memory works, he swerves from that task by offering a diatribe against Christian scholars for their embrace of the doctrine of the inerrancy of scripture. Then, in a bizarre twist, he denounces Kenneth Kitchen and me for not being faithful to what he believes is our inheritance creed. Because he raised this issue in his essay, I wish to point out that Handel has a history of animus toward conservatives and believes traditional positions should not appear in scholarly publications. And there's a footnote there where he says that back in August of 2010, Handel wrote for, for Barr, Biblical Archaeological Research, uh, farewell to SBL, Faith and Reason and Biblical Studies, in an op-ed 10 years ago, Handel objected to the society of biblical literature allowing fundamentalist groups holding their meetings in conjunction with SBL and, and opined that Bruce Waltke's conclusion that Pro Proverbs 1 to 24 was Solomonic when reviewing Michael Fox's commentary on Proverbs was quote unquote rationally absurd. So basically when Waltke said, well, I think Proverbs 1 to 24 is from, you know, Solomon-like, Handel goes, oh, no, that's rationally absurd. And if you go to that SBO link, uh, you have at least like 70 different scholars of various fields actually commenting and saying, Handel, you need to grow up, stop being a child. I kid you not. That's some of the comments I was reading in that, in that list. So then it, yeah. in conclusion, Hoff... Go ahead, finish up. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I'll just read this next bit because this bit shows what I think to be a clear bias on his part, although he wants to say that the so-called fundamentalists of Christians have a certain bias, right? And as his documentary wants to try and communicate, there's a bias. So Offmeyer says, uh, because he raised this issue in, this, in his essay, I wish to point out that Handel has a his. Oh yeah, I just read that. So then at one point, he temporarily withdrew his membership from SBO in protest. His aversion to conservative scholarship bubbled over publicly at the Exodus Conference at the University of California in 2013, geologist Stephen Moshire, whose vital work on the northeastern delta of Egypt, has revealed the Bronze Age paleo environment of this region, presented a paper, and Handel was upset by the suggestion that the route from P. Ramses through North Sinai might have something to do with the Exodus itinerary. 
he immediately mm. denounced Moshaya, asserting, quote, to go from text immediately to geology in the modern context of critical scholarship is intellectually indefensible. But then the twist is Manfred Bietak, a giant in Northeastern Delta archaeology, demurred with Handel, thanking Moshaya for his quote unquote fascinating study and stating, it is absolutely legitimate and cogent to find out the physical backgrounds to what is possible and not possible regarding the, the Exodus. So hmm. I'd just yeah, like uh, to just throw that out there, that that's, that's the discussion happening with legitimate Egyptologists who are evangelical, Hofmeyer, and Handel, who are from the very like 19th century sort of source criticism model that he's still hanging on to. The point is, Hofmeyer didn't do any ad hominems in any of the works. No, he didn't. You're right. Handel's the one doing that off the bat. So Hofmeyer, his his rejoin as well. Okay, fine. You've 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 fired shots at me. Well, yes, yes, yes. What was going on behind the scenes, folks? So, yeah. yeah. Yeah, and if anyone wants to see my my video I did on our Christian scholars bias, Handel appears in it because he does make those kind of claims. Uh, I have it linked right here, or I have it on the screen if you want to check that out. Uh, just showing that this there's actually some sociological research showing there is something called Christianophobia in academia. This is documented by scholars like uh, George Yancey and others that there is this kind of mentality showing up we see with Handel. So you can also check out that video below by Testify, which might be related. All right, let's get back into this video here. And I'm gonna we're gonna move to the another section of the Exodus. And towards the end, we're gonna do New Testament stuff. So Eric and Than will jump in more on that. Uh, you know, we kind of are going to focus on areas we've each been studying most on, uh, for this thing. So let me pull this back up and let's play the next section. Mennonites, according to evangelical scholars, are so awful, they deserve to lose their homes. Please locate your nearest exit now. God simply wants to steal the Canaanites' land. Thank God. Satan gets it. But God's plot to steal the Canaanites' land is about to take an unexpected turn. Think back to the ites of Israel. If Moses and the Israelites never came from Egypt... If not out of Egypt, where are the Israelites really from? Where did they come from? For reals. So when the archaeologists look at the material culture of early Israelite villages, they're continuous with the material culture of Canaanite culture. It's the same culture. What? Aren't Canaanites the bad guys? Hebrew is a Canaanite language, and the early writings from the Bible show a clear continuity with older Canaanite literature, with Canaanite poetic forms, literary forms, people's names, people's language. This is all native Canaanite stuff. Early Israelite settlements left archaeologists with native Canaanite stuff. One of the names of God in the Bible is Ael. And Ael, we know, was also the name of the chief god of the Canaanite pantheon. Evidence that Israelites worshipped the Canaanite god, El, is written into the name Israel itself. It is? Including the name Israel itself, which originally meant something like El rules. El rules? Who rules? The Canaanite high god, El. El rules. Now watch this. So the combination of archaeological evidence and textual and linguistic evidence makes it seem pretty obvious that the early Israelites were Canaanites. Whoa. Oh. All right, let's stop there. All right, a lot to talk about here. A lot of, a lot of claims were made. Uh, so first thing I want to I want to note on this is the whole idea of the name uh, yeah, El, El Rolls. Um, for one thing, that's speculative. Uh, the word can also refer to struggle, and I've heard more scholars talk about it refers to struggling with El. Uh, that, that sort of was, it seems like it was asserted, like there was a, some sort of proven fact. It just simply is not the case. The biblical data seems to support this idea. It refers to wrestling with El. And this idea that you know the Israelites worship El, I mean, I don't think I've ever heard one Christian scholar ever deny that. Like the, one of the first things I remember ever learning was one of God's name is El Shaddai. Like this is not something that anyone is hiding or would be shocked by. The Canaanites, uh, people, Ugarit, for example, had a different theology than what the Israelites had. This would be like saying, oh my goodness, we found all these early texts from Nag Hammadi talking about Jesus in this way. Therefore, this was what the earliest Christians believed. No, that doesn't work. Just because 
they had a different competing theology with what the Orthodox Christians had. Likewise, the Israelites' view of El was different than what the Canaanites' view of El was. This is just an uh, association fallacy. You're basically saying, look, Canaanites have El, Israelites have El, associations. Next thing to point out is we would expect uh, the Israelites to have similarities with the Canaanites. They, after all, were originally in Canaan. They were Semitic people. We don't argue that they were like purely Egyptians coming out of Egypt. They still re retained a lot of their Semitic identity while even in Egypt. So we would expect cultural similarities there. The next thing I want to point to is I want to pull my slide up again and pull up again another important point that I use to argue for the Exodus, which is internal evidence uh, from the uh, Pentateuch itself. So as I mentioned there's archaeological evidence, but there's what I would say is even better evidence. It's the internal evidence of the Pentateuch. So we've got a lot of evidence that there is Egyptian influence over the Israelite texts, over the Israelite culture, uh, to make the claim that this is just this is a continuation of Canaanite culture. I don't even think William Deaver or Israel Finkelstein argued that. I think they argued that once you get to the end of the Bronze Age, we start to see a distinct Israelite culture that is different than the prior uh, people that were living there. So just to get, go through some of these examples, there's Egyptian loan words throughout the Pentateuch in a, to such a high degree that it would not be something we, and it's not something we see comparable to Edomite language, Moabite, or even Ugarit languages. Uh, we see numerous Egyptian names in the Pentateuch, and the names fit with the second millennium BC. They've got uh, expertise on uh, topodins like Ramesses. The Ark of the Covenant, I remember Scott Nagel uh, wrote a paper on how this fits with like Egyptian ritual furniture. And David Falk has written a book on this, that the Ark of the Covenant is not something we would expect coming out of Canaanite culture. This is Egyptian in origin. The horns placed on the um, the altar in uh, uh, in the book of Exodus, again, fits with Egyptian culture. The priest's attire fits with Egyptian culture. The use of turquoise, the name Moses, the use of Egyptian conquest policy. We see them setting up in the uh, fashion of how Ramesses sets up his tent. tent. Uh, Exodus 14 to 15 is a uh, the Song of the Sea, it's the most similar thing it is too, is the Kadesh inscription from Egypt. Uh, we've got a lot of very, very good evidence internally that there is a Egyptian influence over the Israelite culture here in numerous ways. And to move on to the next slide, Kenneth Kitchen notes in his book, it has been suggested that the use of agricultural terraces to exploit hill slopes does date from the 13th and 12th century following the tree clearances. As for pottery, the earliest stuff at early Iron One sites is closely related to outgoing late bronze two wares. But in due course, the typical uh, unita uh, ut util utilitarian iron one wares were developed that are no longer Canaanite in nature or definition. These have become early Israelite, but possibly could have been adopted also from other Highlands people. So here's two things to note. We know there is evidence of a distinct Israelite culture, but he even acknowledges another possibility here that maybe it's coming from somewhere else. Uh, see here. So this is for a later slide I want to get to. So we do see evidence of this Israelite culture. Uh, that doesn't actually fit. Israel Finkelstein, for example, also says in the Anchor Bible Dictionary, in his entry on, uh, he says, talking about the entry of Silo, he says that, he says, these are the most important building remains of Iron One's Shiloh, indicating development construction techniques and architectural concepts already at the early stage of Israelite settlement. So I was very confused by the whole, this whole section. To say that just when we look at the Israelites coming into Canaan, that they just sort of are the continuation of the Canaanite culture is just not accurate at all. There is a lot of evidence of a of Egyptian influence, a lot of evidence that they were uh, had a distinct culture that was just not the continuation. And the most notable thing is the new Israelite settlements lack pig bones. We see in the earlier layers there were pig bone use, and then it comes back in a little bit later. But during the specific towards the end of the Bronze Age with these new Israelite settlements, we see a huge lack of pig bones. And we see an explosion of new sites coming up all over the place. So to say that we just have no evidence and this is just a continuum of a Canaanite culture is just absurd nonsense. There's plenty of evidence. So, all right. With that, I'm going to pull right back in. So again, we're going to let my, my guests will be speaking more later on. Uh, we sort of talked about this earlier that I would cover more of the Exodus stuff and then they would jump in later. So I don't want anyone to think that my guests are just sort of being ignored. Uh, trust me, when we get to the Daniel stuff, I'm going to keep my mouth shut because that's where that's why Rob is here because I've just not had a lot of time to study that right now. So I'm going to go up to 1842 and let's talk a little bit about the Israelite origin story. Oh. 
one thing about about this documentary is it jumps around depending on where it wants to be. So I made to go back a little bit more there. Anyone with a brain available? Like, duh, Israelites can't be from the promised land. Because later in my book, they still got to enter the promised land. <laughs> this guy, all right? I, I already entered, okay? Why lie about escaping Egypt? Inventing fantastic origin stories is what everybody did. Every schmuck has an origin story. That's what I'm trying to say. We all got them, okay? Israel is right. John Collins explains it. The peoples of the ancient Near East engaged in what might be called competitive historiography to show how their national heroes outshone the heroes of other peoples or were the true and most ancient founders of culture. You're saying all this Bible history is just made up to impress. All right. So we have to talk a bit about the Israel origin story. Here's my thing on this. And this is something James Hoffmeyer noted. If you're going to invent an origin story, you're not going to invent it with that your actual ancestor was a foreigner in that land. I mean, could you imagine a bunch of uh, Hare Krishna saying that God gave them Texas because their ancestor migrated there a few generations ago? Uh, I, I think you would have something more like that we were the rightful descendants of this region long before these other Canaanites moved in. Sure, people came up with origin stories. People sometimes exaggerated the length of origin stories. But just to assert that because they have an origin story, it's made whole cloth is just a conjecture. It's a non sequitur. That doesn't follow. And if you did, as Hoffmeyer has pointed out, why would you invent one where the actual ancestors this land was promised to admit it or admittedly foreigners? And then you are a bunch of slaves coming out of another foreign land, which is Egypt. That doesn't really sound like it'd give you a good right to Canaan in a lot of sense. That just seems like it's a little bit of an, a, a stretch in saying that, yeah, that would be a really, really convincing origin story there. So I'm not really yeah, sure how I, that supports them. But yeah, go ahead, Rob. I, I suppose... Let's also look at this. You muted yourself, I think. Oh no, never mind. You're good. Oh, okay. Yeah, let's let's look at this also from like a bird's eye view. Um, Collins's approach is obviously like like as if he's narrating 2001: Space Odyssey. <laughs> uh, for the sake of argument, let's have the Bible play out as like a story. All right, like a say even a fictional story. Um, how how curious so you have the torah specifically again let's pretend you know wellhausen's perspective we don't know who the authors are they, they, these are also maybe exilic and post exilic writings but you have this grand narrative that has a lot of cultural memories so like going from the rivers of eden uh the two of which that have been discovered by satellites grand gun penetrating radar from the late 90s onwards that meet at the Persian Gulf. So somehow a post-exilic author or an exilic author was able to remember all those details, carefully stitches together this narrative into the Apkalu myths in Genesis 6, carefully stitches it to the Tower of Babel scenario, then introduces all the happenings of, say, Genesis 14, those particular kings there, some exilic author had the means of, of knowing their names and and the you know discussions taking place, transpiring through to bring about, you know, Joseph, the Exodus, all the way through to say Daniel and Ezekiel and, and the contemporary situations, which ironically critical scholars will say, oh, now we apart from obviously Daniel, but say Ezekiel, we can't put Ezekiel in like a Maccabean context because yeah, Ezekiel's got a lot of things happening right in the exilic moment. So they place Daniel's writings pretty much relevant to where he's positioned. The point is, these are a collection of books where there's this grand narrative of this so-called deity, Yahweh, bringing about an outcome, and then that outcome is the Messiah, Jesus, and his uh, unbelievable, sort of like, like totally uh, paradoxical, way of how he's going to bring about salvation that is he's going to incarnate die on the cross and then the cross becomes the central fulcrum of all of history like where this is leading up to is the cross so somehow canaanite jews already had all this mapped out as a skeletal structure so that down the track we expect people to follow through with where we're leading the story um like that's 
by implication, I mean, think about it psychologically. By implication, that's what you're expecting. In conclusion, why don't we see the same with any of the other myths of the engineers moving forward? We don't see a, a survival of, say, the Baal mm. cycle uh, becoming this grand, you know, the Logos tabernacles and human flesh sort of language. Uh, so Hebrews wants to certain conclusion. Hebrews one starts like that. In the past, in various fragmentary ways, God spoke. But now in, in the final sense, he spoke through Jesus. That's, I, I mean, theologically, that is the, the approach, which is a little bit too coincidental to, you know, to just look at this purely naturalistically and see how this all plays out. Yeah, so just to recap there, uh, thank you for that, Rob. Just to recap, though, the whole claim up to this point is we have no evidence for the Exodus. But we're not going to discuss the fact that there has been a lot of evidence for the Exodus offered. If you want to see a list of evidence and the sources I've used from actual scholars, see my Exodus Rediscovered documentary series. It's three parts long. See a lot of archaeological evidence, a lot of internal evidence showing Egyptian influence on the Israelite culture and pointing out this could not just have been come, this could, could not just have come from the fact that Egypt ruled over Canaan and the vassal kings they had in Canaan. There's actual evidence that shows that it had to come from a culture coming out of Egypt, the Semitic type culture. So we do have a lot of evidence for the Exodus. A lot of this stuff has been addressed. And a lot of the slides I'm going to be showing and have shown have actually come from videos I've already done re responding to this stuff. Like when we get to the whole Jesus was a failed apocalyptic prophet nonsense and that. But um, so a lot of this stuff has been addressed. A lot of this is very one sided and pretending that somehow this is all just Christians know this stuff and we're just keeping it hidden, which is just not accurate. Uh, but with that, we're going to start moving ahead to the moral issues, because, again, a lot of fluff in the middle of this, though, they just keep saying over and over again, no evidence for the Exodus. So but we want to get to the next point, though. So here we go. There's that beautiful psalm. Psalm 137. This is Reichel. Doctor. Yeah, doc. You're so smart. You don't even know what psalm this is. I wish I could remember exactly which psalm it is, but it's the beautiful psalm. It's Psalm 137. And at the end of the psalm, they're dashing the baby's heads against rocks. My turn. Happy shall he be that taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. Happy baby smashing? In the Bible? Book of Psalms, Psalm 137. Everybody sings the first line of the psalm. By the rivers of Nobody sings the last line. Taketh and dasheth thy little ones against the stones. Metaphorical, perhaps? Toss me into the bosom of my stoner mom. It's ideas ha. that you should have these babies and strike them up against rocks. To me, it's odious. Extremely unpleasant, repulsive. Smashing babies qualifies. It should not be called beautiful. It should not be celebrated in any way. You lied again, Satan. I found someone on YouTube singing the last line. Hey. And so we just tend to repress or ignore those aspects of the Bible. But I. All right. Before she talks, I want to say something about this really fast. And then I'm going to finish her her clip here because I do think it's important. Uh, this was one of the things that I mentioned earlier that a youth pastor explained to me. Uh, not something that was ever hidden, ladies and gentlemen. But I also found a really good quote from Robert Alter in his translation with commentary on 314 of volume three. He says this, no moral justification be, can be offered for this notorious concluding line. All one can do is recall the background of the outrage feeling that triggers the conclusion. The Babylonians have laid waste to Jerusalem, exiled much of its population, looted and massacred. The powerless captives ordered perhaps mockingly to sing their Zion songs, respond instead with a lament that is not really a song. It ends with a blood curdling, blood curdling curse pronounced on their captors, who fortunately do not understand the Hebrew in which it was pronounced. So I'm confused why this whole thing was actually included in the documentary itself. This is not a command from God. This is not even God speaking. This is not someone that something God is necessarily endorsing. It's just a psalm, a psalmist, who is lamenting over what the Babylonians did them in Jerusalem. And it's like, 
let's turn this on you and see how you would feel and to their captors kind of thing. I don't see this as some sort of problem. I think it captures the emotion of what the actual uh, captives of the Babylonians thought and felt and in understanding them there in their historical context. That's always been the way it's been explained to me, even when I was growing up in a church. Never once did this like surprise us. We were like, yeah, this is how horrible they felt. This is what was going through their thoughts, their emotions, their feelings. And it's something we need to understand is what humans actually experience. It's a very good lesson in psychology when you go through something so horrific as that. These are the kind of emotions you're going to have. And then what I find funny about this documentary is I'll let her finish it out in a second here, is that she kind of says kind of the same thing I was just sort of telling here. So when I heard uh, the scholar here talk about this, I was like, yeah, that's kind of the point I was trying to get at. But Eric, what did you want to say? Oh, no. I mean, just as somebody as famous as C.S. Lewis. Oh, you are is... muted. Wait, um, are you? Never mind. Go ahead. You're fine. Yeah, no, I'm fine. Might be my headphones. You... I mean, they're talking about like Christians don't talk about this or something. And I'm like, C.S. Lewis, like specifically on his reflections of the Psalms, talked a lot about this particular passage. Um, and obviously he didn't agree with it. He, he kind of agreed with a lot. I'm just trying to say like somebody is notable as C.S. Lewis, who's who's more notable of a Christian than C.S. Lewis, um, talked about this particular psalm, basically made similar points to you just made, Michael. Um, I mean, I've always kind of looked at this even as a younger Christian is like, well, you've heard it was said, but Jesus is saying, I'm saying, telling you love your enemies. And so like, <laughs> reflections of folks emotions um coming out of the exile and all that other stuff is not like a divine endorsement of of everything that's going on and we're going to see this later in the same documentary when they bring up child sacrifice and different things like that it's just like i i don't know i'm just like what what christians are just like yeah this is great let's go dash some babies heads against the rocks of course and i know that's kind of the point that they're trying to make but at the same time it's just like i think we all kind of know that the this is Israelite culture expressing themselves coming out of a, a, a horrifying situation and they're human beings and they're coming from a different culture than, than our kind of a culture. And Jesus comes and he basically is like, this is the way that it was, but I'm saying now, no, love your enemies and all that other kind of, you know, all that good stuff. And so anyway, yeah, yeah that's, that's, that's what I wanted to say. Yeah. That's a good thing to point out here. I mean, no one said, I mean, even Jesus said there were things in the Old Testament that were not approved of by God. Like he gave them the law of divorce because their hearts were hard. So we need to take this in context if you're going to be using this to attack Christianity in our Sunday schools. So okay, let's let her finish, though. But I uh, think it would I? be more interesting to engage them. One second. More interesting for who? And I think what it would lead to is a deeper empathetic experience. We would understand the anger. We would anger understand the suffering. We would understand what they thought had been stolen from them in a much deeper way if we were willing to engage the horror that's present there. Yeah, and I don't know of any Christian that hasn't or has been has not taken that approach. The fact like that she sort of like that the, they included this in the documentary as if this is something that would upset us Christians really just makes me think the creators of this documentary don't understand Christians and they just want to respond to this caricature they have of us. I was really just sort of like, shocked that this was supposed to be some sort of big big secret in the bible when this is something that i've known about for years and it's the way she explains it is always the way i've sort of understood it mm -hmm. uh yeah go ahead sam what did you i wanted to, to bounce off of that but rob i know you wanted to say something if you want to go first uh basically i was just going to say ancient areas and background imagery is right rife so like for example uh it's not just psalm 137 Hosea well, 13 16 says by the sword they will fall, but their infants dash to pieces, and their pregnant women torn open. So, people like the, the Pritchard, for example, has an entire work called Ancient Near East in, in Pictures relating to the Old Testament, where he showcases the Assyrian, the the just the gruesome Assyrian evidence of what transpires when those culture groups uh, do. X, Y, Z to other culture groups. So when the psalmist in Psalm 137 and Longman brings this up, it's imprecatory. It's, this has been done to us. Ergo, like we would expect the sort of, like the eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth sort of mentality. Mm. But Longman makes the point 
that notice that God is silent in that psalm. And in all the psalms that are imprecatory, God is silent. In other words, this showcases the humanness of the text. It's the, the Bible is not the Quran that just fell out of the sky. So I'm from eternal tablet. And this is what God thinks. The psalmist is a genuine human. Here's our reflection. I would feel that way, obviously. Uh, but what's God's response? Oh, yeah. The way the exile transpires through and then finally the way it comes out. God, in his sovereignty in the bigger picture, in hindsight now, did indeed do good in what he did. So, and no babies were dashed, by the way. It's not like the Israelites coming out of the Israelite, out of the exile started to go, all right, now's a chance. Now that Cyrus has liberated us, let's bash some babies against rock. I mean, it's it's ridiculous. That's not what happened. Yeah, and it's presented in the documentary like this is somehow presented as if God is endorsing this or this is like presented as a good behavior or something. Like with, especially with the Hector Avalos clip. It's like, like again, do you understand what us Christians believe and how we've understood this passage for a long time? But uh, go ahead, Than. Yeah, no, and that, that kind of fits into what I wanted to say, which is, and I want to be clear, I understand that there are some Christians out there that treat the Bible like it fell out of the sky and we're reading... Yeah ancient hieroglyphics given to us directly from God. But I I want to be careful what I'm saying here because I it I find that, I find targeting that, and it feels like that's kind of like the rhetorical target of this video is the, the Christians that view the Bible like that. Um, but I feel like that's the equivalent of the same thing as theists being like, well, all atheists think that everything came from nothing and uh, we all evolved from rocks and yada yada, like that kind of rhetoric. And... The atheist would be rightly annoyed that we're attacking just this weakest link in this species right. of thought, right? Because Christians have a lot of different views on the on the on inspiration, but a lot of us we don't think that was that Moses or Paul or anybody was writing, and all of a sudden they just, oh, I don't even know what I'm writing, and then they wake <laughs> up, <laughs> right? Like we think that there's this dynamic. And sometimes even just supervisory relationship between God and the biblical authors and editors, and we 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 expect to see some human aspects, and not when we're not trying to read all the scripture as this Western idiosyncratic way of just let's just play take the plain reading of the text. I could go on for hours about this, but this is going to be a really important backdrop to the rest of this video, especially when we get into these moral issues. Um, that just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean that God is approving of something or anything like that. The, the, I feel like inspiration itself and the different models are one of the most overlooked and underappreciated like parts of these discussions. As right. Paul says in Romans 15, what was written in the past was for our admonition and learning. And so therefore, just to clarify for anyone who may misunderstand me, I'm not saying that I would have an eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth mentality. So if, if my child would dash against me, so therefore, oh, I expect that to happen. No, uh, that's not where I would go. Instead, the the harder rule is to do what Jesus does or commands me to do, and that is to love your enemies, do good for those who persecute you. Like that is a much harder rule to follow, and so therefore, since it's harder, it is true, and therefore that should be. Uh, conclusion when we then retroject back into the Christotelic readings of these of these ancient pieces in, in the Old Testament. So, in, in, for example, this particular song. All right, ladies and gentlemen, with that we're going to move on to the next with regards to the uh, con Joshua's conquest issue. So I'm going to play this out and then Than, you got a ton of notes we're going to talk about here. I will leave nothing undone. Oh, right on. Okay, so by the way, that's Joshua who's talking with the the shredder type voice. In the seventh chapter of the book of Deuteronomy, God lays out his attack plan for Joshua's assault on Canaan. Direct orders for the Israelites when they enter the promised land. Already entered, sir. Said that once already. Say it again. I will leave nothing undone. Hey, this guy. Okay, yo. Yeah, I'm already here. Look down, huh? Stay in your lane, Israel. Now, Joshua, listen up. And when the Lord, your God, brings you into the land you are entering to possess and drives out before you many nations, then you must destroy them totally. Make no treaty with them and show them no mercy. Do not intermarry with them. Then why are all your boys sliding into my DMs? 
Do not enter marrying with them, for that would turn away your children. Why are we doing it? It would turn away your children from following me to serve other gods. Ultimately, it's a covenantal thing. You know, maybe it's unfortunate, but we can't leave those people there. They're a bad influence. And what are Israelites to do with them? Kill them. Kill them all. Utterly. Kill everyone? They deserve it. So, just a real crap before we start getting into this. This little girl right here. If you don't think they're trying to constantly caricature Christians or make Christians look bad, at the end of the video, she's the only one who, like, stays with Jesus, and she's the one who's also, like, the most evil. So, like... Okay, uh, yeah, this is definitely why you can see why Christians can be quite upset by how they're being represented here. But all right, let's she's, get into the whole. She's Angela from The Office, basically. <laughs> she's basically <laughs> Angela from The Office. Yeah. yeah. Thanks, guys. Really, really, let's see how you guys picture us. Really shows you guys want to work together and find common ground. Yeah, when you represent us like this. What, real, real well done. All right, then you wrote like a ton of notes on this whole Joshua conquest here. I don't know if we have time to cover them all because you wrote. We know, we don't. Um, yeah. so th th there's a lot of clips that like all the notes that I took on this encompasses a lot of the clips too. Um, for specifically for Joshua, let me just pull this up quick. Um, so let's start here actually. So in like, we have examples in the ancient Near East of just total kill hyperbole. And a lot of the stuff I'm taking here is from a book called bloody, brutal and barbaric, um, by, um, William Webb and Gordon Ost. Um, and they have references to a lot of other places and they have tons of citations. I'm just kind of going to try to keep this brief, but here are some examples of ancient Near Eastern total um, kill hyperbole. Um, we have Egyptian King Seti I. He boasts that he was so powerful that he, quote, cares nothing for even hundreds of thousands gathered, which I would argue and many other people would argue is clearly hyperbolic. One king is not going to take on hundreds of thousands of people. Um, we also have Shalmaneser the thirds, um, and we have tons of sources for this, but there's things like the Kirk monolith, um, the Kala bulls, the marble slab inscription from Assur. Um, and this is talking about something called the battle of Kirkar. And from there you have all these different rounded numbers from 25,000, 29,000, 20,500, 14,000. And the whole entire point is these different inscriptions and writings are just pointing out that it's kind of like what they said, that competitive historiography. They're trying to just boast, it's showboating. Um, and there's different categories like severity hyperbole and um, a geographic hyperbole, all sorts of stuff. So some here's like just some basic evidence that might make you think about this. So for instance, in Joshua is the conquest of the entire geography. Um, Joshua 13, one through two reveals that despite Joshua's old age, there were still large areas of land to be conquered and the text lists territories yet to be conquered. Although Joshua 12, eight, um, suggests that the conquest of the Jebusites and their King, um, in Joshua 15, 63 contra contra contradicts this. And it's stating that Judah couldn't dislodge the Jebusites from Jerusalem. Um, the Jebusites remained until the time of the monarchy when David conquered Jerusalem in 2 Samuel 5, 6 through 8. And similarly, Joshua 12, 21 through 23 indicates victory over the kings of certain cities. But Joshua 17, 12 reveals that the Manasites couldn't occupy these towns due to determined Canaanites, showing that the land was not fully conquered as previously indicated in Joshua 1 through 12. Right. So that would be like that. Those contradictions would be evidence. And I'm not saying these are actual contradictions, because if it's hyperbole, it's not really a contradiction. Um, and that's kind of the whole point here. The same thing goes for, and you find tons of these examples for the annihilation of entire city populations, right? If we take this hyper literally, well, then we find these contradictions. And in the are contradictions, I, it, I don't, do you get what I'm trying to say there? I'm trying to popularize and just condense this to move yeah. on. Okay. Well, I got some slides I want to put up. So when you're done, I'm going to throw up some slides. No, go ahead. Other examples. And, right, and so, I also yeah. have a comment on Deuteronomy 7. Once you all finish, yeah. So, yeah. Yeah. Let me uh, let me go through these slides really quick, and then Rob, you can jump right on in there. All right. So K. Lawson Younger Jr. says, while there are differences, e.g., the characteristics of the deities in the individual cultures, the Hebrew conquest account of Canaan and Joshua nine nine twelve is by and large typical of any ancient Near Eastern account. So he's basically pointing out it's very similar to what we see in other ancient Near Eastern accounts and various war annals. Uh, we can see he lists some examples here. So the great army of Mitanni is. It is overthrown in the twinkling of an eye. It has perished completely. 
as though they had never existed, like the ashes, the end of a fire. So I don't think Tut Moses III actually annihilated the entire army. And this is one of Lawson Younger Jr.'s, uh, uh, K. Lawson Younger Jr.'s uh, examples. Another one, the Merneptah still says Israel was laid waste. Uh, obviously, Israel was not laid waste. We see similar in the Mesha inscription that Israel had been utterly perished forever. Okay, not all of Israel was wiped out by the Moabite kingdom. This is a uh, typical hyperbolic language that we'd see in the ancient Near East with regards to war. So we also see, for example, Sennacherib saying that the soldiers of Kirami, I probably butchered that, dangerous enemies, I cut down with a sword, and not one escaped. Okay, similar with uh, Mersili II, probably butchered that name. Uh, so you get this idea that we see a lot of this ancient or eastern war herbally. So uh, Younger Jr. says, if scholars had realized the hyperbolic nature of the account in Joshua, if they had compared it with other ancient or eastern accounts of complete conquest, the image of the conquest as represented in Joshua would have emerged in a far clearer focus than it has. So what he's pointing out is that when they talk about this utter annihilation, utter destruction, it's war hyperbole. It's not necessarily meant to be literal. This is how they wrote about these types of events in the ancient Near East. Uh, Zioni Zevit says, when the composition and the rhetoric of the Joshua narratives in chapters 9 to 12 are compared to the conventions of writing about the conquest in Egyptian, Hittite, Akkadian, Moabite, and Aramaic texts, they are revealed to be very similar. Kenneth Kitchen says, this was how military reports were customarily written. And these structures and others are co the common coin of the second millennium already, long before Neo-Assyrian times. So uh, here's an interesting example right in the text of Joshua. It says, when Joshua and the sons of Israel finished striking them down with a great blow until they were wiped out. And then Kitchen highlights the fact that the very second half of the verse says, and when the remnant that remained of them had entered into the fortified cities. Okay. So the, the, the language of Joshua in 1020 is hyperbolic. They obviously were not all wiped out if there's a remnant that's going back into the fortified cities. So what he's basically pointing out, and as the scholars I cited are pointing out, is that this is not saying, yes, utterly annihilate them to every last little child out there. This is about driving them out of the land and using the typical ancient or eastern war hyperbole to do so. So to say that this is somehow God literally commanding the, the utter total destruction of literally like every last baby is, I don't think that's a necessary reading of the text. I don't think that's the most likely reading of the text. Uh, Rob, what did you want to add to that? You want me to show my screen or just read it? I don't uh, whatever know. you want to do. Yeah. I, can, I can put it up on there. You should share it. it so that way the audience can see what you're doing, too. All right, all right, all right. It might be helpful. So this is an excursus on Chapter 7 of Deuteronomy. I'm just going to bring it up. Yeah, I'll share it as soon as you put it up there. Okay. And then I'll just... It's just two short paragraphs I want to read from it. Uh, let me zoom right in. Is that clear? That's clear. Go for it. All right. I'll start from over here, the infamous command. So the infamous command to harem them, so devote to destruction, show them no mercy, in verse 2, refers, as we have demonstrated, to destroying identities, not people, as is indicated by the destruction of identity markers, that is called objects, in verse 5. The list of things... Israelites are to do to them consists of breaking down their altars, smashing their sacred stones, cutting down their Asherah poles, and burning their idols in the fire. It does not include killing every last one of them. Indeed, if every last one of them were killed, the prohibition in verse 3 against intermarriage would be unnecessary. Yeah. The reference to nations, peoples, and even survivors all refer to community identities, not individuals. This is especially the case with the kings who are the embodiment of the identity of the community they lead, which is why they specifically killed throughout Joshua's campaigns, and whose names, in this case identity, are, quote, wiped out from under heaven. We should also note that God's threat in verse 4, which is the verse that the documentary used, is not against the Canaanites. That is, it does not say, my anger burns against them and I wish for them to be destroyed, but rather against Israel. The Lord's anger will burn against you and will quickly destroy you. Which, by the way, later in Deuteronomy, again, if you take the Deuteronomistic history perspective that it's written again. Wait a minute, like, Rob. Wait a minute, Rob. Are you saying the father of lies just lied about what Deuteronomy said? <laughs> yes. Again, again, the documentary is aptly named. And we're going to get to that again when we get to 1 Corinthians 15. But, but, please but, continue. but the reason why I'm saying, so, so later in Deuteronomy, when, again, people like Handel will say, oh, the stipulations about you're going to be exiled 
is obviously written in exilic or post-exilic period. Well, the point is the same book, all right, is, is warnings against Israel. If you do this, then, oh, by the way, I'm going to throw you into exile, which, as we know, happened. So, in conclusion, this is the last paragraph. Verse 25 repeats the command to destroy the color objects, this time specifying that they are, and the term there is an abomination. That is contrary to covenant order. Verse 26 not, wants not to bring the abomination thing into your house, which generally refers to a household, that is of family micro-identity, rather than a building, in which case bring into does not mean carry into a space, but rather more idiomatically adopt as your own. So the penalty for doing so is, is you, like it, will be that harem, right, devoted to destruction. Mm -hmm. Now, note that the you refers to the entire community, not only the building where the idol was brought, or even the household that adopted it. The opposite of bring in that they are told to do instead is, as the analyze and Ivy puts it, the detest nature of it. So this is the verbal form of the same root where the abomination term is derived, and it means isolate apart from the identity of the community. Now, if I skip right down to the conclusion, notice the conclusion here. Uh, the crime of Israel is not uncouth behavior, but covenant infidelity. The people of Canaan cannot be punished for covenant infidelity because they had no covenant to break in the context of the grand narrative of the story. So Yahweh is making a covenant with Abraham, then it's Isaac, then it's Jacob. That's repeated in Exodus 6, 3. By my name, Yahweh, I was not known, but you know, I was known as El Shaddai back in those days. How interesting that applies directly with the, 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 you know, the evolution of the language per se, because Yahweh cannot be a, a term that's applied anachronistically back in Abraham's day. So it's 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 correct for that to happen in, in Moses' context. And then this this comes right through into Deuteronomy. So this is this is the sort of scholarship I'm expecting someone like the guy who made the documentary to Yeah. If he's going to be a nuanced documentary and, and actually give, say, a fair treatment, why not give that side instead of just the one, oh, the, the one I'm, band sort of guy like Hendel just playing the beat. I'm, I'm one last thing. Sorry, Mike. No. I, I'm glad you brought up that harem uh, part, Rob. And there's one quote I just want to read from Webb here because I can hear it in the back of my head where people are going to talk about God's displeasure with Saul. Um, and so I'll just, I'll just read this. Um, God's displeasure at Saul's failure to kill Agag is not because Saul has failed to kill every breathing Amalekite, merchant, shepherd, farmer, and so on. The status and role of King Agag means that he is not an average Amalekite. Only by killing the embodiment of the Amalekites, the Amalekite king, in battle could Saul have claimed obedience to Yahweh. At root, the issue is with Saul's pride, his self-aggrandizing acts, honoring his own military prowess and not Yahweh for victory in battle, and his failure to trust in Yahweh to establish his kingship. Real quick, um, then, that's about 1 Samuel 15 is what you're talking about, the whole conquest yeah, yeah. with the war with Amalekites. The one where it says all the Amalekites were wiped out, and then Samuel has the king of the Amalekites, and he says, "You're as you made other mothers childless, so shall your mother be childless. And it's like, well, I thought you killed them all. How is his mother still alive? Is that the one you're talking about, Dan? Yeah, yeah. Which we didn't get into that part yet, but I, I found, I think that's important because yeah. that's going to come up. Yeah. Well, it, that's another good passage. But I mean, again, this is why we say this is propaganda, ladies and gentlemen. As Rob pointed out, they're using passages that are directed at the Israelites and saying this is God commanding the, uh, talking about the uh, Canaanites. It's either sloppy editing or it's propaganda, unfortunately. And they should not have used that passage the way they did. That's just taking it wildly out of context. And we've not even gotten other places. Like, I'm, well, we'll get to 1 Corinthians 15 later and you'll see other issues. But um, all right, to save on time, though, instead of just going on, there's a lot more we could say about this. I'm working on some more research on this for upcoming videos, but we need to move on for the sake of time here. So let's play the next section we have time we have marked down. You think? It actually doesn't matter whether it happened or not. Huh? It's the principle. Okay, so he's, uh, when he said, just to give some people some clarification here, when he says it doesn't matter if it happened or not, he's talking about Joshua's conquest. So the yeah. same kind of context. That you should kill people to take their land and their property, and that you should kill people because their religion is different. Those principles, we should have a zero tolerance for them. Whether Amen. it happened or not is irrelevant. 
because the principle remains. All right, well, I respect him. Yeah. Good what point, did you say, Rob? What'd you say, Rob? No, this is uh, earlier in the stream. I said this is why I respect, for example, Hector. He's, yeah. despite him losing his faith, I still respect him as a human being. Yeah. And I said amen because I think we would all agree here that we shouldn't go out in on a live a bunch of people. I don't know if we're allowed to say, I don't know what the, <laughs> the take. It's, it's, it's not TikTok. TikTok. It's not a TikTok. <laughs> TikTok, TikTok rules. Yeah. Here. There are no TikTok rules here. You're fine. Yeah. Uh, I don't know. Yeah, I would agree. I don't like we're not supposed to go out and kill a bunch of people because they worship differently than us. And that wasn't the point of these conquests. Um, and uh, something I just really want to point out here is uh, in that clip somewhere, Hector alludes to the biblical authors thinking that they thought this was OK and that they thought God approves and likes war and likes genocide and is happy about these things. Um, and I just wanted to, I'm not going to read through all of these, but there are points where there, there's texts in the Hebrew Bible that are subversive in into this idea that Yahweh enjoys war and enjoys battle and has this bloodlust. And I don't know if you want to go over that now or if you want to go over that after. No, let's done. do it now. Do it okay. Now. So like, let's just start with like the Enuma Eilish. And um, there's, I'm not going to read everything, but the basic idea is like the creation account itself is is in it with is with a battle um and there's tons of violence in it and all this other stuff but when you contrast that with something like genesis there's no violence in it it's a like some people might point to some of the similarities and i'm just going to say that seems more like a polemic against these people saying that yahweh creates without tension yahweh creates effortlessly from and there's no battle or any war happening that should be like one of them aside from that you're going to have places where God is grieving war violence. For instance, like you have Ezekiel's oracles against the foreign nations. And these are lamentations expressing grief about the coming judgment in Ezekiel 27, 2, 28, 12, 32, 2, 16, um, and so on and so forth. Um, you have Isaiah's oracle oracles. So for instance, um, Isaiah 16, 9 says, So I weep as Jazer weeps for the vines of Sibma, Heshon, and Elila, and I drench with you tears. Another one would be like Isaiah 16, 11, My heart laments for Moab like a harp, my inmost being for Kir Hereseth. Um, you have places like this with in Jeremiah. You have other places like in the Elisha narratives where God actually intervenes to stop violence by giving a blinding light. Um, if you're familiar with like some of the ancient Near Eastern stuff, um, there's an ancient Near Eastern backdrop of temple building by warrior kings to help. And that helps us understand the character of Yahweh even more. Um, after like we grow up and we think of David as like this really awesome king and we paint him in this awesome light and yada, yada, yada. But in the ancient Near East, after this big battle, you would build a temple and then um, it'd be part of like your celebration of the war winning and all this other stuff. And you have Yahweh stopping David from building a temple and we read in first Chronicles 22 7 10 for instance David said to Solomon my son I had it in my heart to build a house for the name of the Lord but this word from the Lord came to me you have shed much blood and have fought many wars you are not to build a house in my name because you have shed much blood on the earth in my sight and then it goes on and talks about how Solomon's going to come and he's going to grant Israel peace but the whole point is Yahweh doesn't want his name associated with bloodshed he doesn't want his name associated with war. Yeah. Um, and so these, now, these are all already... like. Oh, sorry. Kidding? Sorry with the, the time delay. I thought you were done there. Uh, but... No, I'm done. Okay. Yeah. So now, now I can already hear Dan McClellan responding to that saying, well, you're just assuming univocality of the canon there of the text. And the obvious response to that is, is this is a false dichotomy. It's not either they contradict or they are all speaking with one voice. You can say that we're going to look for similar texts from the same culture to find a more general meaning of what they believed and to make comparisons, that kind of thing. And also, this is being presented as an internal creek for the Christian worldview. Uh, you're saying, like, if, you, if, if your God is so loving, what about these texts? Well, we're going to point to other texts. So if you're going to present this argument as an internal critique of Christianity, we have every right to look at other texts that talk about God that we say that are inspired to better understand God's character here. So... It's I want to preempt that objection because I can already hear that coming in my ear. All right. So with that, let's move on. Uh, let's get to the next section here. This is a small section I wanted to respond to from a sociological standpoint because it's uh, Hector kind of going off on tangent and making 
some claims he just cannot substantiate. So let's play this really quickly, and I'm going to put a study up. But history continues to see real violence inspired by Joshua. There's entailed ideas about violence and genocide that were paralleled repeatedly throughout history. The liberation of the Israelites and the subjugation of the Canaanites are two sides of the same coin. Read from the Canaanite perspective, this was not a liberating story at all. Oof. Irish guy knows nothing. Joshua battled wickedness. And if God commands us to kill them all, kill, kill them all. In fact yeah, guys, this is totally being being fair to Christians, representing them accurately. I mean, if you want a comparison, I see atheists get really mad when they see how they're represented in, in skits by the Babylon Bee. And, and they're they're confused why we'd be upset by this. Like, come on. All right. Uh, with that, I'm going to pull a study up here uh, to talk, respond to this whole idea about the idea that this is inspiring violence here. So, all right. So this is a study I've cited a lot by Davis Brown, the influence of religion on interstate armed conflict. Now, Hector Avalos made the argument that Joshua's conquest is it going to inspire more violence and cause more violence. Well, why does that not play out in reality? So in this study, he looked at three different religions and their influence on interstate armed conflict here. Let me just scroll under the tables here so you can see what I mean. So he looked at Christian, Muslim, and Buddhist. Now, Joshua's conquest is only in the Christian text. Uh, what were his conclusions, though? Uh, he basically pointed out, and you can see them basically here, Christianity negatively correlates with an increase in interstate armed conflict. Islam positively correlate, correlate with an increase increase in interstate armed conflict, Buddhism with non-significant. You can see the non-significant markers there. Uh, so his his idea that just because there is a conquest in a text, it's going to lead to more war is unsubstantiated. It's not supported by the data. And as I noted earlier, Avalos has been responded to not by a Christian, but by an atheist, Nathan Johnstone, who wrote this excellent book, The New Atheism, Myth and History. So, and I've interviewed him on my channel. Uh, he's pointed out that in, in the very book they're using in this documentary, there's a lot of double standards. There's a lot of dismissals, conjectures, sort of bending the evidence. So at one point in in the uh, in Johnstone's book, he points out that Avalos says this. He says, Avalos believes that religion is especially prone to encouraging violence because it artificially creates scarce resources to be fought over. If this is so, how should we theorize the motivation among some atheists to obliterate sacred space altogether and to kill the uh, uh, ins inscriptorial, sorry, I'm butchering that word. For all its own reality acknowledged, atheist violence is passed over by Avalos in a in a couple of sentences and so is exempt, and so is exempt from the, the, his own theory. It apparently has no meaning worth discussing. And John Stone points out in his book, we can find examples of atheists targeting religious people. Now, John Stone does not make the argument that means atheism causes violence. He says, look, if if the new atheists are right, that religion causes violence for the same criteria they use, we'd have to make the argument that atheism also causes violence by their own criteria. And so Avalos has just presented so many like unconvincing arguments, unsubstantiated arguments that have been addressed numerous times at this point. You can also check out William Kavanaugh's book, The Myth of Religious Violence. Anytime I wanted, to, I, I've, I've written or talked with historians They've independently recommended that book by William Cavanaugh because it just really hits the nail on the head when it comes to this idea uh, with regards to this whole religious violence thing. So if, if you guys don't want to add anything else, I want to say another quick note about the golden rule. So I'm not going to play the clip because we all want to save a little bit on time here, but they bring up this idea about the golden rule that uh, Christians claim is woven throughout history. It's just a humanist rule that we should all be employing. Here's a quick note on that. Most they what the thing they don't know in the documentary about the golden rule is that most ancient golden rules are not the way it is presented in the New Testament. So if you read Thales, avoid doing what you would blame others for doing, or another, do not do to others that which angers you when they do it to you. Most golden rules, not all, but most golden rules prior to Jesus were in the negative. Don't do things to others. That you want done, that you do not want done to you. The golden rule in the Bible is presented in the positive. Do unto others as you would have them done to you. And that's what gets really popularized. So there is a difference here in terms of psychology because 
with the negative, you don't actually have to go out and help your neighbor. You don't actually have to go out and do certain things. Jesus's golden rule demands that we actually go out and help other people. Do undo others. It's in the positive here. So they're pretending like this idea that this, this golden rule is just woven throughout cultures, but it's mostly in the negative when we look back in history. Uh, it's the Christians that really popularized it, and they have it in the positive, which does encourage uh, a much more progress forward thinking idea, this idea of charity forward thinking idea. You can fulfill Thales' golden rule just by sitting in your house. You can't fulfill Jesus' golden rule just by sitting in your house. So they don't note that distinction. That's an important distinction in how it plays out in human psychology with that. All right. Since you guys are being nice and quiet here, I'm just I mean, going to go. I, go ahead. I could just add a few things. Uh, this is from... Um, just very briefly on the golden rule thing. So, for example, this is Kenneth Samples' work on, in his book called God Among Sages, Why Jesus is Not Just Another Religious Leader. Golden rule, or even he dubs it even as like a silver rule <laughs> with respect to the, the way the other cultures uh, perceived it. But in summary, he says, um, though Christians can agree with the Confucian teaching of Shu, right, the silver rule, uh, what you don't want done to yourself, don't do to others. Again, it is not the same standard as New Testament golden rule, which is, it goes further. For a Christian, it is not enough to avoid treating people badly. A people in a, a believer in Christ is to aspire to treat people graciously. So, it it you know, it goes beyond that. Now, so you know that has said love, the agape love, that sort of. How, like, like Philippians 2 again, the Carmen Christi hymn, uh, have the same mind, uh, just as Christ emptied himself, kenosis language, you empty yourself for other people, that sort of thing. Uh, now, can I make a quick comment on the why Canaan scenario? I mean, is have we passed yeah. the topic or are we still in it? No, we can, we're about to finish that up. Uh, so go ahead and make a quick comment on it, okay. and then we're going to move on to the Jephthah stuff. Okay, I think, okay, so I'm going to use this time, this opportunity here to honor Heiser because it's his birthday today, in regards to this very, but he gave a very short answer. I'm just sharing my screen. He gave a very short answer, but I think it's the best. And if he was still alive, he would have been working on this particular question that was raised to him. So I'm sharing my PDF screen at the moment. Yeah, I got um, you here. You add that up there. Sweet. All right, there you go. Yep. So the question that was raised Instead of giving Israel the land of Canaan, why didn't God just give them Egypt? Both lands are good land. Both lands had idolatrous nations inhabiting them. God had already defeated Egypt. Is there anything that makes the land of Canaan better, the, a better land than Egypt? Other than that, it was the quote-unquote promised land. So Heiser says, this is an old question that really takes us into Unseen Rome 2 territory. And because of that, it's really impossible to answer this in a really coherent way. And so the point here he's saying is, look, this is there's a lot to unpack here, but he's but this is his very short answer. I think the answer to why Canaan is made comprehensible when you know about the Amorites and the Amorite migrations. These are historical events and peoples. The Amorites are a big deal. I think God chose Canaan because that is where the concentration of the Genesis 6, the flood chaos fallout had settled through the Amorites and then later the Hittites and the Hurrians and then the Sea Peoples. Now, a number of the people group names of the conquest and the rationale for the devote to destruction bans are linkable to the Amorites and the Hittites and the Hurrians and, of course, the Sea Peoples. All these groups are sort of intertwined because of migrations and invasions that wind up not exclusively in Canaan. But Canaan becomes kind of ground zero for these people groups that all have traditions about their own descent from the Flood and from the gods. And this is his conclusion. So that's why I think Canaan is important. All roads link back somewhere to these people, and specifically the Amorites. The Amorites have these traditions. The biblical writers looked at the Amorites very negatively because the initial Amorite migration actually sweeps through Babylonia, sweeps through Mesopotamia. What we think of and what the biblical writers thought of as Babylonians, in other words, the anti-Eden people, is actually Amorite. Hammurabi was an Amorite. He was an Amorite king, a part of the New Babylon Empire. The second part of Nebuchadnezzar's agenda was to revive the Amorite dynasties that had gone before him. This is why Og, Bashan, and, and so on. So, in conclusion, Ezekiel 16 has a very, like Ezekiel 16.3 has a very interesting phrase, which, by the way, Handel says, or tries to use as his argument that the Israelites are Canaanites, because it says, uh, your father and mother are Amorite and Hittite. 
and golden gain is upcoming commentary on Ezekiel, I have a draft of it, um, gives a very interesting Heiser-like response to that. Um, uh, so, and I'll just leave it there. So, All right. Well, I because I know, warn... pe I know people listening like Golden Gay. So, yeah. right. Well, I want to warn you, Rob. Sus IP is looking at you in creepy-ass ways. So sorry about that. <laughs> Sometimes it's a little weird followers. That... Look at that picture. Wait, can you just make that face quick, Mike? No, I'm not gonna. I'm not gonna entertain because that super chat was way too low for me to entertain a facial expression for you. How dare you! Sir? <laughs> I wonder who that is. Uh, maybe that person may meet you if it is that person I'm, I'm thinking of. Uh, I don't know if I want to meet that person in life. I might, might, not, may feel a little violated. All right, so let's move on to the child That's sacrifice good. issue. To require the sacrifice of the firstborn, the Judean kings Ahaz and Manasseh are accused of child sacrifice. The practice cannot be dismissed as due to foreign influence, but had venerable precedence in the cult of Yahweh. Baloney. My god is not cool with killing innocent children for divine favors in battle. That may be, but the god of the Bible is. Victory in battle is related in an integral way to your offering these things to the deity. In the 11th chapter of the book of Judges, Jephthah, the leader of the Israelites, who are at war with the Ammonites, Moreites? from Canaan, wanting to secure victory for the Israelites, Jephthah makes a promise to God. If you give the Ammonites into my hands, whatever comes out of the door of my house to meet me when I return in triumph from the Ammonites will be the Lord's, and I will sacrifice it as a burnt offering. The leader of the Israelites promises God he will set fire to whoever greets him first when he returns home from battle. He will uh, devote to the Lord first thing he sees. But of course, it, it turns out to be his, his daughter, his only child. And I'm back and I won. Who's behind door number one? All right. I think we can stop it there. We get the idea. So this is a point we have noted before. Just because it's in the Bible doesn't mean God is endorsing the behavior. Judges is really written in a topological fast fashion, starting with the good judge, ending with the worst judge. And Samson is the last judge. He's not set up as like this great moral exemplar. Neither is Jephthah. Just because these people do things, it doesn't mean God is approving of their behavior. And yeah, I don't understand exactly how the example of Jephthah is supposed to actually make us go, oh, yeah, God is okay with this. That's not yeah. a good argument. I mean, Judges is, it talks about the word of the Lord being rare and everyone was doing what was right in their own eyes. I mean, the, the whole point of Judges, it was like a generation that came up after Joshua that just dropped the ball and were thoroughly canonized themselves. And so, yeah, just because this is described, like you said, Mike, it's, it's not prescribed. Um, just like God's not endorsing Samson's behavior either. You know what I mean? And so I, I thought this was like a really strange inclusion because it's just like such a weak, I don't know, yeah. argument to throw it, in there. Now, some will make the case that there's a place in Exodus which is mentioned <clears throat> in this, and you combine it with what Ezekiel says in Ezekiel 20 as evidence that God approved a child sacrifice. Now, uh, Kevin, uh, I probably, I'm the worst with pronunciation. Freebel, I believe is how you pronounce his last name actually wrote a really interesting chapter of a book where he covers this and argues that, no, the language of Ezekiel does not support that as well. Uh, so, no, I don't think the case can be made strongly. I think it's far more likely that uh, the places in Ezekiel and Exodus are not approving of child sacrifice. Uh, there's a lot more that could be said on that. Uh, you can check out some videos by my brother-in-law, David Wilbur, who's gone more into these papers to see some of it or just read the actual chapter. But this is a really interesting topic i think a lot of this has been addressed and i don't think the actual evidence supports the idea that god actually approved a child sacrifice so uh but with regards to that anything else you want to touch on with that eric or should we move on i'm good yeah uh, i'll just yeah, quickly I... say uh william prop in his anchor yale kex's commentary called it darwinian suicide if you're talking about exodus you know the consecrating the firstborn if, if, if the israelites were doing child sacrifice he called it darwinian suicide and he prop disagreed with the with, with that argumentation 
Yeah, that's another good point. I always forget about him. Uh, so, all right, let's move ahead to the next section here, and I will hit play. Should morality be based on the Bible? Dr. Avalos? The very idea that a text should tell you what you should do is immoral to me. How so? Because now you're saying that, that whatever somebody writes is what becomes moral for you, uh, as though it, it was based on authority. Morality should not be based on authority. It should be based on your empathy for the suffering of other human beings. Let's shine a light on that. Morality should be based on what? It should be based on your empathy for the suffering of other human beings. Nice opinion, flesh human. Empathy for the suffering of others? That's all we need for good morals? Add in the humanistic golden rule and... Yeah, we're good for now. That's it? That's only two commandments, and I got ten. You got nothing. All right, my, my first thought there is which golden rule, the negative or the positive one we find in the Bible. Uh, but uh, I forget who had notes on this, so I believe it's you, Than. Go ahead. Yeah, uh, it was just a quick note that, and I don't I don't blame Avalos for this because he's not a philosopher, um, but I don't think many Christians are going to, say like the ground of moral truths is going to be the bible um and i want to be careful here because i don't i don't want to again he's not a philosopher but the other thing is just like if you're going to say that something written isn't going to imply some kind of some kind of authoritative ethical demand on us well what are what are our, our law codes in countries um it, it seems kind of weird to say something like, well, you can't have these authoritative commands that impl that put some ethical demand on us. Um, so I just kind of wanted to point out there's a lot of philosophical nuance that's go that's there. And I just think that there's some things going wrong there. But for brevity's sake, that I'll keep it there. Well, I mean, philosophically, it just doesn't work. That you're saying morality should be based on empathy. OK, what's the where is the objective prescription yeah. that we should do things for empathetic? We should have morality based on empathy. I mean, these are issues you, that Thomas Nagel would even raise. It's, it's, that's not a way to ground morality. That is, that's more of a normative stance. That's not a meta-ethical stance, let alone yeah. a moral ontology stance. So, yeah, that just I, I see some atheists throw that around or non-believers throw that around. I'm just like, that's not that's not what meta-ethics is about. You, this is more of a you made a normative ethical stance as if that's moral ontology or if that's meta-ethics. That's that's not how this works. Yeah, empathy empathy can be an epistemic tool for us to like right. know different moral facts, just like scripture can be. But the grounding of these moral facts is not going to be in empathy or in the Bible, and we can both agree with that. All right, are you guys ready to move on to Daniel? Rob, you ready? Yeah, I mean, all right. I was I was really wanting quick. to share a few more things on. Anyway, okay. no, no, we can move on. We can move on. Yeah. Uh, well, do you guys need me yeah. for anything else on this? Because I got to get going here in a little bit. You're good, man. You got to take off. We understand entirely. Okay. Uh, I'm going to see this through because I want to get to the failed apocalyptic stuff. Uh, but uh, let's go to uh, uh, the next time marker here and we'll do cool. that. Thanks for having me on. Yeah, yeah go watch it. Go watch your hockey game, you hoser. <laughs> <laughs> Oi. All right. I'll catch you later. Have fun. Here's seminary standard stuff about the book of Daniel. Standard stuff about just, just pause it, just pause it quickly. predicting the future. Yeah, you prophecy. Yeah, yeah. What, what I wanted to show quickly in conclusion, because I want to bring this to the gospel. I want to bring this to Jesus. Uh, now, here is a comparison between Jephthah, the story of Jephthah, and Jesus. Just for the sake of intertextuality here. Uh, I'm showing my screen. All right, yeah, let me put that up for you. It's, it's a very it's a very brief table. So notice the comparisons here. Jephthah's only daughter, Jairus' only daughter. Preceded as judged by Jair, spell in the ancient Greek translation, Septuagint. Same sort of spelling in Luke. Land of Jephthah, land of Jair, so obviously that's Gilead. Guess what? Jesus enters that same region on the east side. Uh, this now, is a, like a typological type prophecy type thing. Like typolo they're doing like typology, correct? Uh, I wouldn't say it's prophecy. All I'm saying is, in hindsight no, I mean, of typology, right, 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 right. Yeah. But th this this would also fit. I find it curious. Like I'm not saying Luke is deliberately doing an intertextual 
mm -hmm. you know, parallel here. But the point is, it's a little bit on the nose mm -hmm. that the God, that the true God incarnate, Christ, starts to do a mopping up job of the sins of the past, basically, mm -hmm. in a de in deliberate locales that will bring to mind you as the reader. So, in other words, if you read the Old Testament, and as John Golden calls it, the First Testament, then we, when you come to the Second Testament, you should then recall, you know, similarities transpiring and, and responses to those to, to those in the past. So, by the time you reach then the contrasting sides of it, notice you have an Israelite leader who worships Yahweh in the manner of false gods, but a Jewish leader who embraces Jesus. A selfish vow results in human sacrifice of his daughter. Well, in Jairus' daughter, he unselfishly pleads to Jesus for the life of his daughter. An Israelite girl is sacrificed to a foreign god, but here a Jewish girl is raised by the true God incarnate. So one has the daughter dying, the other has the daughter raising to life. So this fits with the famous Deuteronomy 32 worldview that Heiser proposes, that um, when, when you have the New Testament uh, replying back to the events of the past, then the events of the past are not just some random vacuum that, you know, the God of Israel decides to at one moment be like, okay, I'm going to behave this way and then I'm going to behave differently, say, in the New Testament era. No, it's a consistent story. The New Testament is part of the Old Testament is, is basically the point. Um, I mean, I could share more on Keats, the Jurel, Child Sacrifice in Ancient Israel, his dissertation that became a book, which... Uh, he himself argues that uh, Israelites were not wholesale just sacrificing children. You have mm -hmm. moments, again, rare moments of abominations that were happening in Israel with child sacrifice, but it wasn't the rule. Uh, sometimes the rule was misinterpreted. Like, for example, rabbinic writers like Rashi would say that you, you, could, mis you could misunderstand what firstborn means in the Exodus narrative. All right, I'm going to play a little bit of the yep. Daniel stuff. Rob, tell me when you want to stop on this, and we'll go from there. Sure. See, Daniel was stupendous. A total winner. Daniel made many predictions about the future that came true. Proof the Bible is a godly book. Admit it, Satan. Daniel did predict all those things that came true. Yeah. Hmm. I wonder how Daniel did it. By pretending to be someone living in the distant past, an author could predict the future. Huh? Pretending? Like doing impersonations? Excellent, Betty. You are right on target. The book of Daniel, allegedly written by the great wise man of the 6th century BCE, BC me, was actually written in the judgment of almost all critical scholars some 400 years later. Ah, what the whoa, fuck? liar. If the book of Daniel was written 400 years later, then that would mean Daniel did not author the book of Daniel. His name is on the book, Bart. The reality is that the author wasn't living in the 6th century BCE. He was only claiming to live then. He was actually living in the 2nd century, 400 years later. You have a span of time right. in between. All right, pause. All right, you and... got it. Yeah, pause it. All right, now I will say before you get going, I, I admit mm -hmm. this is not really my area right now. I'm studying some things. Benjamin Noonan gave me some things to look at. I don't really know where I land on this, and I don't really see it as too much of an issue even if it is the late date. Like, if this is never like a big concern for me, but... um. What are your thoughts on this, Rob? Uh, do you want me to share my written thoughts on this, or do I just spill out, just verb vomit a lot of the things? Because I mean, it's a lot just, to... whatever, you, whatever you want to do, we'll do it for all a little right, bit right. here, but you know, but right. don't like. Go, uh, like I, won't, I, won't, I won't go too far. I won't go too far. I won't go too far. <laughs> it's fine. So, it's fine. <laughs> so I just want to point out that I've done my, as an own my own little hobby project. I've actually written as an amateur, my own commentary on Daniel, but relying on the scholarship. So in, in the context of the book as a whole, let me just summarize. I think, so I'm in the, in the company of say, Longman, Wendy Witter, Golden Gay, by the way, which in his revised Daniel commentary for WBC, uh, he's still a Maccabean date setter, but in a very nuanced way. A lot has transpired. Uh, in fact, I've been reading studies like books published with respect to the um, the Aramaic of Daniel. Like there's a whole dissertation on that. Not that it's talking about, say, the language per se, but rather any sort of redactional forms transpiring. Like in other words, was there an original text that then 
became massaged over time. So there's a lot in Daniel that showcases a 6th century BC narrative or event. Every chapter that I've been reading, and I've, 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 I haven't been looking at your conservative commentaries like, say, the classic Gleason Archer commentary on Daniel. I've been sticking with current scholarship, even the critical scholars like, say, Michael Siegel, who's written on Daniel. Um, a lot of them hold to the final form to be a Maccabean book, and I'm fine with that. But Yeah, I would be fine with that too. Right. But there's, they're now going back to a, a Daniel that is actually from chapter 1 to chapter 12 as a unified whole. Initially, there was this debate about how the language shifts in chapter 2 verse 4 and, you know, from Hebrew to Aramaic. And, and, and what's funny is it doesn't stop. So in other words, when the Chaldean astrologer speaks in Aramaic, he sh it should revert back to Hebrew, but really continues on right throughout until basically chapter 8. The point is, with further research opening up the book itself, how could a Maccabean author know about the happenings of, say, the Baal cycle in chapter 7? How could a Maccabean author know about things like the old Persian loanwords and those very ancient archaic loanwords that, that, for example, that one of the key points is that the Septuagint translator didn't know what to do with some of those words. Um, Actually, before I continue with with uh, actually, I, I have it. I have it in. I have it in this anyway. But this, but this particular book as well, from the Enoch seminar. This is Enoch and Qumran origins, new light, a forgotten connection. Uh, James Charlesworth, for example, is a contributor in that volume, and I quoted him in this uh, commentary where basically, when you look at the Hebrew Aramaic composition there's a very interesting summarization of it being quite ancient, quite old. This particular scholar, Benjamin Noonan. Ah, I knew you were going to bring him up. Yeah, uh, I knew that. I, right. I had to talk to him about this. I actually talked to him directly about this. Yeah. Oh, sweet, sweet. That's awesome. So yeah, he released a book, Advances in the Saudi Biblical Hebrew Aramaic, New Insights, and he basically argues that you have to deal with the fact that, and here's a whole list that I... I carefully stitched together based on um, his very complicated uh, loan word book um, because that thing is a tome in itself. So I, all I did was I carefully, it took me like a whole month just to stitch these words together, all the refer relevant references. Notice that this is Noonan's statistic. Notice that you have about 34, uh, so notice all Iranian would be 23. Uh, Hittite is is one. What five particular Greek, but they're ancient e Egyptian. There's also five terms used. Noonan basically says that look, this this it communicates that there's an author or some sort of memory from the sixth century BC to maintain these archaic terms. Now, if I skip all the way down to say Qumran. Interestingly, uh, Peter Flint has commentated on this, that uh, you can go back as far back as, say, 125 BCE, up to around 50 CE. So Foku Dan C and Foku Dan B is, is uh, the, the, the dating range. Now, where I want to go with this, just to conclude for now, is the statement that Charlesworth made. He, he says that, the members of the Enoch seminar agree on the probable date of the earliest composition among the books of Enoch. The consensus is now that the Book of Enoch, sorry, the Book of the Watchers was composed by the early Hellenistic period and may reflect the struggles of basically Alexander's uh, successors in 323 BCE. So the writings now called the Books of Enoch originated before 200 BCE and conceivably as early as the end of the 4th century BCE. Here's why this is important. Because... Roger Beckwith says, early traces the book of Enoch, right? He says that Enoch, the, the question is, is Enoch relying on Daniel when it comes to Daniel chapter 7? Or is Daniel, the Maccabean author Daniel, relying on Enoch? And the surprising answer is, Enoch, the author of Enoch, is 
relying on Daniel, which means if Charlesworth is correct that you have Enoch at least at the end of the 4th century BCE, then chapter 7 is pre-4th century BCE, and therefore chapter 7 cannot be Maccabean. Chapter, chapter 7 has, has to be, you know, as traditionally dated, which makes it even worse because, uh, and I'll stop sharing my screen here. Yeah. Chapter 7 focuses on what's called the Baal cycle. The whole Ancient of Days is exactly El as an ancient age deity, and Baal as a cloud rider who approaches the Ancient of Days is exactly the Son of Man in Daniel 7. And Michael Siegel himself says, yeah, we should not be conflating the people that will then share in the glory and the kingdom of the Son of Man. We have to say the Son of Man figure there is Yahweh, or in this mm -hmm. case, that second power in you know, as Alan, not this, by the way, this is Michael Siegel, not Alan, the, the famous Alan Siegel of the 70s who wrote The Two Powers in Heaven. So Michael Siegel in the, in basically 2016, he published a book, Dreams, Riddles, and Daniel. He argues that, no, 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 this is based on the Baal cycle, which is very ancient. So, so chapter seven then, uh, let me share my screen one more time. Yeah, you got it. Yeah. Uh, now, this is all interesting. This is stuff I've been wanting to look into. I just haven't had the time. But I mean, like, uh, just to really quickly say, uh, like, yeah, I, I would be mm -hmm. perfectly fine with saying that Daniel reached its final form in the second century BC. I remember David Carr mentioning this, making an argument of what, with regards to the Song of Songs with that, that it's, he argued it was very, very ancient, going back to the time of Solomon, but it did not reach its final form until the Qumran period. So, I would have no problem with saying the same thing about Daniel. It, yeah, please it, continue. It, it, basically, it all boils down to chapter 7. This is the chapter that that lynches the whole thing together. So, notice that, I mean, in, in this particular section in the commentary I'm writing, you have variations of ideas of what the composition looks like. What's the unity of the book? Some argue for a chiasm structure to the book. So, for example, here you have a paralleling structure to the book. Um, so Daniel 2 parallels Daniel 7, Daniel 3, Daniel 8, and so mm -hmm. right? But the best argument, and this is the latest in the discussion, is called an overlapping structure. So notice that you have chapter 1 as its own historical setting. It sets it up. Chapters 2, 3, 4, 5, and 6 is its own concentric structure establishing God's sovereignty over the Gentile nations. Then you have from chapter 7, 8, 9, 10, uh, 11, 12 as its own concentric structure, but it's it's four particular visions, and, t and 10 to 12 are actually lumped together as one massive unified structure in itself, mm -hmm. which means chapter 7 unifies chapters 1 to 6 and 8 to 12. And if yeah. chapter 7 predates Enoch, then the whole book predates Enoch. That's the ultimate argument over here. I could That's go a, into, it, yeah, I mean, I could go into other niche areas like the actual practices done, like the, you know, the fiery furnace or certain people met named there, or Belshazzar is a famous one, as Zyaxris II, as Stephen Anderson uh, in his 2014 dissertation argued. I can go into all those other details, but the point is that summarizes the latest in the, in the scholarly discussion. No, I think that's interesting. That's some stuff I want to look into. And uh, real quick, just to address this question, I'm gonna we're gonna get to them at the end. When we do reviews like this, the sure. super chats they get saved in a folder. We get to them at the end. We I promise we will read them all out at the end, even if my guests have to leave and I'm the only schmuck here. Uh, but yeah, what Rob is your commentary out, or is that something you're working on right now? It's out in my Google Drive. Uh, just. <laughs> <laughs> But I, I'm revising it, so I, I wrote it up as a as a complete draft, and now I'm just going through just revision typos, adding it any more studies I found. But if if anyone goes to my channel, just on any of my videos, I have my Sentinel Drive folder linked. Just click on that, and you have access to it. Yeah, I want to take a look at that. But yeah, I appreciate that. And we're not. And obviously, there is more to the conversation here. I don't think this is the end of the conversation. But what we're just trying to point out here is what well, the way it's presented in this documentary is that this is just a settled matter. There's no other way things we can say. Pastors know this stuff and they are just, they know that the all the, the, the critical liberal scholars are right and they're just hiding all this stuff from you. 
No, there's more to the debate here. And like I briefly touched about evidence for the Exodus, referring to my Exodus documentary series, which I'll link below after. Uh, Rob talking about some work he's putting out. We're going to get to New Testament and Eric's going to have a field day with that soon. There's a lot of great stuff here. So just like they didn't go too deep into the scholarship to save on time, we don't have enough time to go into every little detail. However, we will refer you to other stuff if you want to get the nitty gritty details on more of this stuff here. So, all right, Eric, it's almost your time to shine here. We're about to get to New Testament stuff. So, uh, and I'm going to have some slides I'm going to throw back in as well. So let's continue on here into the New Testament. Books have voices and you can hear an author's voice. And people actually do this with ancient texts as well. Do they do it with this ancient text, Doctor? So for example, the question about whether Paul wrote or did not write Second Thessalonians often gets argued on the substance of voice. Nearly half of the 27 books of the New Testament claim the voice of Paul. Paul has the most books in the New Testament. And there's something very peculiar about his voice. My voice. At the end of his second letter to the Thessalonians, Paul writes, I always sign my letters as I am now doing. What is peculiar is that he claims this to be his invariable practice. I always sign my letters. Even though he does not appear to have ended most of his other letters this way, including 1 Thessalonians. Wait, so Paul doesn't always sign his letters that way? What's going on? 2 Thessalonians was probably written after Paul's death. Can the dead write letters? Why not? They vote all the time. There are 13 books that claim to be written by Paul, but scholars are pretty confident that Paul did not write three of those books. First and Second Timothy and Titus. Three others of them are hotly debated by scholars, with probably the majority of scholars saying that Paul did not write Colossians, Ephesians, and Second Thessalonians. Of those 13 letters in the Bible that claim Paul's voice, only seven are really from Paul. Ooh. Oof. Oof. All right, Eric. Oof. Yeah, I mean, for, for me. Knock, knock him out. <laughs> For me, when I read uh, Ehrman's book, Forge, and I know it's kind of more of a popular level treatment. He has a more academic version of the same book, basically. But it was the moment that I'm like, I if somebody's going to say biblical scholarly consensus, I'm going to probably look at them and say, OK, so what? What are the arguments? Because the arguments for forgery with Paul's letters, I find to be like based on some pretty weak strands. And it's strange to me how they get kind of trotted out there is like these really undefeatable, you know, strong arguments. So, I mean, since they brought up Second Thessalonians, um, we'll, we'll talk about that one. As was mentioned, it's not as heavily contested as, say, the pastorals. Um, I have a whole video uh, response to Dan McClellan as far as he brings up some of the common arguments against uh, Pauline authorship for the pastorals. Uh, and I, you know, just kind of give a, a different more conservative viewpoint on that. So I would refer people to that. But let's just talk about Second Thessalonians. Um, really, for almost 1800 years, there was a pretty solid consensus on scholarship, uh, or as far as authorship goes on Second uh, Thessalonians. It made its way into Marcion's canon in around AD 140. Uh, it secured a place in the Muratorian canon. Uh, we know that was around 180. You have Polycarp quoting it, Ignatius quoting it, Justin Martyr alludes to it, uh, Irenaeus directly refers to it. But you have Bart Ehrman, he's going to do this whole, well, what about this signature argument? And I'm going to get to that in just a second. Uh, but he basically says, this is his argument just straight out of the book Forged. He says, what seems relatively certain is that someone after the time of Paul decided that he had, had to intervene in a situation where people were so eagerly anticipating the end, so eagerly he suggests that they were neg uh, neglecting their daily duties. Basically, they weren't sitting around, they weren't working. He did so by penning a letter in Paul's name, knowing full well that he was someone else living later. How much later? I don't know. Some scholars date Second Thessalonians all the way to like 100 AD. Um, I think that's really stretching it for their theory to work. Um, and so why does he say they're, they're sitting around doing nothing? Uh, Ehrman, Ehrman says that it's because of the first letter. It's because of First Thessalonians, right? What do we find in First Thessalonians? Paul talks about the end of the age as being this imminent thing. And so they're just basically sitting around waiting for Jesus to come. Um, and so I guess you could see why this particular, the guy who liked the camping uh, documentary <laughs> did all that would probably like this. Um, 
and so basically he's just saying that the theologies in first Thessalonians and second Thessalonians, according to Ehrman, they're not reconcilable because in the first epistle, it's like Jesus is coming back any second now, guys. Uh, where in the second epistle, it's like, well, no, there's these definite signs and the Antichrist has to come first. And there's going to be this big falling away and all of this other stuff. And hey, guys, by the way, don't you know when I was with you that I told you these things, you know, like this, at least on Ehrman's theory, there's some really audacious fibbing going on, you know, a decade or two or three after the fact. Um, and so some Thessalonian Christian, I mean, to me, this is just when you break down this stuff, it just sounds, it just becomes across really far-fetched. You got some Thessalonian Christians, you got Thessalonian Christians, first of all, who are just sitting around 10, 20, 30 years later, still waiting for Jesus to come back. They're not working uh, or not working much, I guess. Like, so somebody is like, you know what? I got to fix this. I got an idea. Um, I, I'm going to say that, no, Paul, you know, really didn't teach that. Um, he doesn't say, I'm going to come up with my own revelation. Hey, I'm a prophet. Let me fix this. No, he's got to really like get Paul's name involved in this. And Paul himself has got to kind of come back from the dead and fix this. And so it, it just kind of sounds a little bit ridiculous on its face that you have people sitting around that much later. Uh, and then you got to have some guy forge uh, a letter in Paul's name and say, yeah, again, guys, this is what I totally told you when I was with you. Um it just kind of doesn't make sense. And when you really think about it, the, 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 the theologies, they don't actually contradict. Um, because when you see like something like in the Olivet Discourse, you see things like, well, when you see these things, you know, it's near right at the door. But then like a few verses later, you hear, see things like, well, the son of man will come at an hour that you don't expect him to come. And so you already see in like the gospels and in Mark and in Matthew and different places like that, this whole idea of there's imminence and Jesus can arrive at any time. Yet at the same time, there are signs to his coming. That's what the whole Olivet Discourse is about. There's going to be things that happen first. And so this is a Christian theology that's just kind of been around. Um, what Paul is saying here just reflects that kind of a thing. Um, when he says that, well, like, there's this signature and, you know, the queen kind of protests too much. Well, Paul does sign Philemon. He does sign first Corinthians. He does sign these other things. The whole statement of why well, I always sign these letters could just be some kind of a, a bit of hyperbole. Um, and if you think about the explanation, the, the teaching in the second chapter of second Thessalonians about, Hey, remember the antichrist has to come. This falling away has to come. I told you these things when you're with you, it's like, how does that really work 20 years from, from, from later? Like, I, I, I just find that to be stretching things a little bit. Um, like, it just makes more sense. Then I'm going to give you this really cryptic saying that theologians are going to debate the meaning of, you know, thousands of years later. Uh, it just makes to, to me more sense if like, no, this really is something that Paul told him uh, while he was there. And like I said, the, we already have this kind of imminence theology well, with and all that other stuff yeah so go ahead right i mean there, there's nothing really in there that would be like out of the ordinary within the line of paul's theology and it just seems a little ad hoc the arguments against second Thessalonians. um i want to get to some notes after we play the next section if you want to move ahead because i think there's some other points that are just being missed with regards to the pastoral epistles i know like stephen boyce and you wrote this in the notes looked at the letter of Philemon and compared it to the pastoral epistles and notes the vocabulary is like 85 to 88 percent similar. So they dismiss the pastoral epistles because it doesn't sound like Paul's public letters, even though it sounds like the language he would use in a private letter that is attributed to him, Philemon. That's so those, those are kind of the issues we see with the dismissing of Paul in these letters. But there's another important point I want to get to after we play the next section. Anything you want to add before we move on, Eric? No, um, I, you're right about the personal letters thing. A lot of times the arguments based on, well, Paul never wrote the pastorals are just like, well, conflicting theologies. You know, he refers to faith, like Ehrman will say things like, well, faith is always about justification by faith and this, that, and the other. And, and then it's like, okay, well, in Philippians, he talks about you guys are contending for the faith. Um, which is similar things that we see in the pastorals. Um, he'll say things, Ehrman will say things like, well, there's this high church structure in, that you only see in the pastorals. And it's like, um, 
because you know there's bishops and deacons being mentioned in the pastorals there's bishops and deacons being mentioned in the greeting of uh philippians and so it's just like right again and, and it's like just like vocabulary arguments that scholars themselves actually they, they're like there's this painted picture like these come from the second century um, when there's been studies done and they're like, actually, no, uh, these don't come just from the second century. Most of them come from the first century. It, it's just a lot of weak strands that they're building an argument on. Um, and it's, it's just, I don't know. I, I find it to be uh, incredibly weak. Uh, a lot of these particular mm -hmm. arguments. And I have a playlist on all of the, the books that if people want to avail themselves uh, as Pauline's, uh, the Paul in epistles, if people mm -hmm. want to check that out. Yeah, I recommend your videos. <coughs> people bring up the uh, contesting of Paul's epistles. I think you handle them well. All right, let's move on to the next section because there's a lot here I want to address. It's accounts. The Bible is primarily eyewitness accounts. What's more real than real eyewitnesses? Eyewitnesses, Satan. Yeah. My apostles saw me do stuff. They wrote it down like perfect journalists perched at the rim of Jesus Canyon. <laughs> My apostles saw it all. John was an apostle, and he was with Jesus. John was also an illiterate fisherman. And he wrote the Gospel of John. And in Greek, a foreign language. Did the apostles go back to school after Jesus died, overcome years of illiteracy by learning how to read and write at a relatively high level, become skilled in foreign composition, and then later pen the Gospels? Yep, that's exactly how it went down. Most scholars consider it somewhat unlikely. Yeah, me too. Uh, I don't think they did write out everything that they basically, they, that's just not the way you wrote in the ancient world. So uh, let me present my slide here for a second. I'm going to put up some slides here because I want to note some things about this whole literary thing. Let me just say for the sake of the argument, I am willing to grant, willing to grant right here and there, all of the disciples, including Jesus, were illiterate. Let me just grant that. I don't think Jesus was illiterate, but let me just say Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, or no, sorry, Matthew, uh, John. Peter, all of them illiterate. Who cares? That's not how people wrote in the ancient world. So here's a quote I have on the screen. He says, dictation was recommended over writing in one's own hand by Dale Chrysostom and famous personages. We are told with, we are, we are told we're regularly accompanied by a slave prepared at any time to take dictation, whether on horseback, in chariot, or in Satan chair, or at the leisure in the baths. Julius Caesar was famous for his ability to keep multiple secretaries simultaneously occupied as he dictated successive portions of individual letters to each of them. Okay. So we also see Seneca. He uh, note that you should not be speaking too fast because it, it, your uh, 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 scribe will not be able to write it down if you talk too fast. Uh, we see, for example, in the letters of Cicero, Cicero was extremely intelligent, obviously knew how to read, and he still worked through his scribe Tyro quite often. Okay. Uh, another scholar, Paul could have verbally dictated certain letters to a scribe by either spelling out exactly what he wanted in a given letter or by merely providing the scribe with a general outline to follow. Or it could have provided the scribe with a written draft that was to be subsequently polished into a final draft to be sent. Such differences among the Pauline letters do not necessarily imply that they were not authored by Paul. In most cases, an individual scribe could imprint a distinct literary style on any document he or she wrote, which would greatly affect form, vocabulary, and perhaps even content. So there's a lot to be said here. One, Paul was clearly literate, and yet he often wrote through a scribe. It says so in Romans. He's writing through, uh, what's the guy's name? Tertius. Uh, Tertius. Tertius, that's it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So in the ancient world, you didn't have to know how to read to write a letter. You could have a scribe do that for you. Uh, so there's no issue here with the fact that maybe John was illiterate, maybe Matthew was illiterate. That would not mean they are not the authors of the Gospels that they, that are attributed to them. This is a really just a, a, a bad argument. It's misreading scripture or misreading the ancient cultural context with modern eyes. Okay. Again, Cicero was educated and they still he still used a scribe. Second thing to note is that oftentimes scribes did not just copy down dictation. They did a lot more. Cicero talks about his scribe Tyro helping him write letters. Oftentimes, the scribe would actually be given quite a lot from the author, and then it would be up to the scribe to sort of put it in a, a, a coherent fashion, put it all together to make a coherent letter. They often attributed more than just merely writing, basically writing down what they heard. 
So when we see differences in Paul's letters versus like the personal versus the public letters, that could be due to the fact that in some of them, like first and second Thessalonians, he mentions other authors, but also to the fact that he was working with different scribes who would have imprinted their own ideas or their own language into it. They would have attributed to the differences we see in these letters. All of this is really just a case of just taking a modern cultural understanding and applying it onto the ancient culture. This is just not how it worked in the ancient world. Yeah. I mean, and even in John's gospel, um, <clears throat> his Greek, I mean, we find clear signs of Aramaic roots, um, which would make sense depending on like how he's speaking or who's helping him uh, from a limited vocabulary to simple syntax and his frequent use of the word Kai. Um, all of the different evidence, different scholars have, have pointed out adds up to Aramaic uh, being his mother tongue. And when John does quote the Old Testament, he's often a lot closer to the Hebrew uh, than the Septuagint. Uh, which obviously is the Greek translation of the Old Testament. Uh, you can mm -hmm. see this in his references, like when he alludes to Zechariah 9.9 9 in chapter 12, when he alludes to Isaiah 6 in also chapter 12, uh, when he talk, uh, basically refers to uh, the 41st Psalm uh, with the portrayal of, of Judas and the 13th chapter. And we see it especially um, in 1937 when he's referring to Zechariah. Uh, his words are nowhere even near the Septuagint. Uh, emphasizing his connection to the original Hebrew. And so, um, I mean, even that in and of itself, like, is kind of a weak, like I said, I agree with you. I, I think they had scribes. I think they had people helping them. Um, but there's also like this kind of idea from some of these scholars too, that like these guys were just frozen in stone and would have had no <laughs> motivation to ever learn like other skills Oh, no. you know, later in life, um, or that they couldn't get any kind of help in these particular areas. Uh, it's just kind of like bizarre to me. Well, it's also the point that they make a big deal in this documentary that Peter could not have wrote letters. He was an illiterate fisherman. Let's right. just ignore first Peter five twelve by right. Sylvanus, a faithful brother. As I regard him, I have written briefly to you. Okay. Right. Why Satan's guide to the Bible? Did you ignore the fact that Peter directly said he's writing through a scribe and then say, well, he couldn't have wrote this letter. He was illiterate. Again, did you read the Bible? It's very clear he's working through a scribe here. Right. They also make the point that, um, oh, go ahead, make your point. Then I want to do something on the Greek. No, no, it's fine. Um, a lot of times when they they make this point, um, and maybe they're not necessarily doing it here, but you do hear it a lot, is they'll refer to Acts 4.13. And it's like, well, these guys were illiterate fishermen. I mean, Luke even says so, right? And it's kind of like, well, that word actually means a grammatoy, uh, which could also mean unlettered. And if you actually go back and you read the Talmud, uh, and the way that the Talmud talks about in certain sections, I don't have the references right in front of me, um, but I can put them in the comments later if somebody really wants to know. Uh, but there's references to the the uh, Jerusalem uh, opinions of people from Galilee. They they acted like they were like lawless heathens. Um, there's there's one reference to where there's a uh, uh, like a. a, a somebody that was sent like a Pharisee that was sent to Galilee. And he was upset that only like a couple of religious cases that he had to settle were brought to him the whole, like two years that he was there because nobody's bringing any like disputes about the law to him. And he's like upset about it. And he's like, you, you Galileans are a bunch of heathens. They, they probably overheard these priests, these Sadducees that are calling him on the carpet, uh, pick up their accent and they're like, Oh no, it's Galileans. You know, they're a grammatoy. They're unlettered. They, they don't know the law. Like we do. We're better than them. Uh, that's mm. what it's reflecting. It's not necessarily saying these guys are so stupid. They can't even spell their name. Like, um, you know, I, I, that's a weak argument to, to argue that. And I'm, again, maybe they are literate. Literacy rates aren't great, but just don't use Acts 413 as your, as your, as your proof text for that. With regards to that they didn't speak Greek, that that is actually there's a lot of evidence against that. Like yeah. it's been presented by like Stanley Porter, K. Scott Gleaves, Maurice Casey, Peter uh, Williams. Uh, K, Peter, yeah, Peter Williams as well. Ju <coughs> Judea at the point was bilingual. Most people of the region were able to converse in Greek. Uh, even some of Jesus' own disciples had Greek names. A lot of the inscriptions from the region are Andrew in Greek. Greek. So yeah, Stanley Porter notes that just in in the when we look at the region, most Jews of that time period would have been bilingual. I'm actually on a video I'm working on um, right now coming out called Did Jesus Speak Greek? Mm -hmm. And it's going to be going to scholars like Maurice Casey, like Stanley Porter, showing, yes, he did. He spoke Greek quite well. Uh, and he would. there's a lot of good evidence from the cultural context and internal evidence that he did. So it would not have been hard for his disciples to translate 
what he said in Aramaic into Greek. And he, many of Jesus' sermons may have been given in Greek at times if he was speaking to people from the region of Decapolis or from Galilee, which was had a lot of Greek influence. William uh, argues was, that the Sermon on the Mount um, may have very well been given in Greek. So Yeah, it's another good point. With regards to the Gospels not being eyewitnesses, I'm going through a series right now, I'm gonna, and I'm going to have one video on Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, each arguing they do go back to eyewitnesses. But I mean, if you look at like Maurice Casey, his book, Aramaic Sources uh, for the Gospel of Mark, he makes the case at the end of that book, Mark had to be getting his information from a member of the Twelve. Now, he thinks it was a written source passed to Mark, but at least he's agreeing that Mark was just not making things up. He was getting his information from some eyewitness of Jesus, and specifically a member of the Twelve. I'm working with Stephen Boyce on a video on Matthew. Uh, there's a lot of good evidence for that. You can see Luke Vandaway's recent books on okay. evidence that Luke was working with eyewitnesses. You can see Craig Blomberg's book, or uh, Josh, uh, Richard Bauckham's book, Jesus and the Eyewitnesses, for evidence that John was an eyewitness. It, again, there's a lot of good evidence to support these, that these are not just anonymous gospels written long after the fact. And I'll be presenting a lot of that on my channel this coming year. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, it's there's an, uh, an embarrassment of riches that Luke was himself a witness um, for the wee passages in the later chapters of the book of Acts, um, which would have given him access to witnesses when he was with Paul, um, when he was arrested in Jerusalem. Um, I mean, you could just go through all of the different things uh, through uh, Colin Hammer um, in regards to that, uh, the book of Acts in the setting of Hellenistic history of just tons and tons and tons of just like, um, facts about overland routes, uh, ports, um, uh, lots of different details of like titles of local officials, um, different things along that, like local customs, um, religious observances, down to even slang in certain points um, that are best explained if like somebody was, was we know Paul traveled, we know he had traveling companions. Um, and so I think the simplest explanation is that Luke was really written by a traveling companion of the Apostle Paul. And I have tons of videos on that particular topic as well. All right, we got three or four more time markers to get to. Uh, and I may even just skip the last one and we may just cover it uh, uh, without actually Can playing I? the clip because we've been going for over two hours now and I want okay. your super chats. But Rob, go ahead, say your thing and then we'll move on. Yeah, I just want to say that uh, Fitzmaier, for example, argues for a bilingual context of the first century. And he's he, another one, yeah. Yeah, and so you have, just to summarize on that language context, which I want to come to a guy named Philip Comfort, Philip W. Comfort, who passed away actually December of 2022, uh, a major loss when, because he's, he was a early manuscript textual critic. That, that was his work. And so he writes that um, there are increasing studies that promote the, the, the view that the Greek of the New Testament was good common Greek that could be understood on the streets of Athens as easily in the suburbs of Jerusalem. To understand the extent of Semitisms in the New Testament, we must consider the multilingual climate of the day. And then he quotes, because you just referenced Stanley Porter. Are you saying that you're responding to Porter or you're using No, Porter, Porter argues that Jesus taught, taught in Greek at times for sure. Right, so he quotes Porter and, he, and Porter says, the linguistic situation was not one simply of two languages, Aramaic and Greek, competing on an even footing. Greek was the prestige language of Palestine, and anyone wishing to conduct business on any extended scale, including any, you know, here's the, you know, the New Testament authors, any, any, including any successful fishermen from the Hellenistic region of Galilee, and probably any craftsmen or artisans who would come, who would, who would have come into contact with Roman customers would have needed to have known, indeed, would have wanted to know Greek. The evidence is that the, is that Palestine, including the Jerusalem area, was part of the Greek-speaking Hellenistic world and had been since the conquest of Alexander, more than 300 years <coughs> ago. Now, now, comfort on the Thessalonians letter, just a quick comment here. He says that first and second Thessalonians are the work of three individuals, with Paul and Silvanus functioning more as authors than Timothy did. Among the two, mm -hmm. Silvanus probably took the lead in actually writing the epistles in collaboration with Paul, who signed off on both of them. And so therefore, and Comfort is basically saying, I, I'd like to understand Thessalonians as 
the authors plural with respect to Paul and Sylvanas and mm -hmm. um, yeah now that's right. Philip Comfort the guy who among others obviously like Dan Wallace and so on who compiles for uh, Nestle Allen critical editions the uh, the manuscripts that's been discovered compiled and you know copulated together and all that Jesus I will eternally be amazed that you Paul you never mention the central core story about the resurrection. It is odd Paul never wrote about the empty tomb. It's super important to know. Maybe he just... All right, Eric, why didn't Paul mention the empty tomb? It's over. This <laughs> yeah. is definitely not an argument from silence. Why did Paul not mention that Jesus was an exorcist or performed healings or told parables or... You know, I mean, his letters are focused on correction and doctrine. They're not, they're not gospels. He gives us a quote. He gives us a, a, a quote of a creed, basically, what scholars believe to be a creed in 1 Corinthians 15, um, which you, they have it on the screen there. Um, it, it's, it's a pithy kind of thing. And the only reason he gives that particular quote is because of an occasion where people are acting like there was no resurrection in Corinth. And he's correcting them and he's taking them to task and he's quoting apostolic uh, information. And I mean... <sighs> The resurrection doesn't make any sense if we're only talking about a spirit or a soul. These are Jews. Let's let's remember that. Uh, the word itself implies the body coming back to life. If it's a guy in the tomb waking up, physically rising again, and so the tomb has to be empty. It's just like I think that people can put two and two things together. Uh, first century Jews had a strong idea of resurrection, and so if you said that to them somebody was buried and they rose again from the dead, well, of course, they're going to presume that there was an empty tomb. Like, this is this is pedantic. Yeah, uh, N.T. Wright. N.T. Wright said, like, this would be like saying that, hey, I walked down the street and not mentioning that it was on my two feet. Like, right. it, it, it's not necessary. And Mike Lacona has done a whole, in his book, The Resurrection of Jesus, there's a whole section on 1 Corinthians 15. It just notes the language is not spiritual resurrection. This is mm. commonly taken out of context. The words for spiritual and natural refer more to enlightened and unenlightened. Paul is clearly using language of a physical body coming up. Uh, he doesn't need to mention the empty tomb. And so there's this constant implication. Well, why did he mention it? Why did he mention it? Well, that's not what Paul was focusing on. And in fact, I just did a video called The Hidden Gospel uh, in January. Just pointed this kind of stuff out. Paul is assuming over and over again in his letters, they have already heard the gospel message. He doesn't need to recite it again. Like he doesn't need to bring up every single detail. He keeps right. telling them, yeah, you already heard the gospel. You already heard the gospel. You already heard all this stuff. And that happens numerous times. So see my video, the hidden gospel, and you'll see Paul does this over and over again. There's no reason for him to mention all this stuff again. So. Right. All right. Let's get to the failed apocalyptic stuff here. Cause they're going to claim that Jesus uh, predicted the end of the world in the first century. And there's a lot of stuff to be said on that. And then we're going to close this out and uh, move to some super chats where Paul connects Jesus's resurrection with the general resurrection very clearly. He's the first fruits. Thus he speaks of Jesus as the first fruits of the resurrection. Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. If the harvest has started, then the rest of the harvest has to come soon. Jesus was the first fruits of the resurrection. Okay, so they're trying to say that 1 Corinthians 15 basically says that Paul is saying that, oh, the end is going to come within our lifetime. They're neglecting some very important verses in there. So let's just read verse 20 where he says this and then read after that. But in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. For as by a man came death, by a man has come also the resurrection of the dead. For as in Adam all die, so also in Christ shall all be made alive. But each in his own order, Christ the first fruits, then it is coming those who belong to Christ. Then Paul tells us what needs to happen for Christ to return. He says, then comes the end when he delivers uh, the kingdom of God to the Father after destroying every rule. So after destroying every rule and every authority and power, for he must reign until he has put all enemies under his feet. How long does Christ have to reign before the general resurrection ha ha comes? Well, and he has to reign until all enemies are under his feet. Then the last enemy to be destroyed will be death. Guess what, guys? Not all enemies are under Jesus' feet. Paul is clearly talking about some things still need to happen before the general res resurrection can happen. Specifically, all enemies need to be under his feet. 
since the kingdom of God is not advanced over the whole world, I know I'm leaning into my post-millennialism here, but since the kingdom of God is not taken, has not fully encompassed the whole world, there are still enemies of Christ, the general res resurrection cannot happen. So they'll say that Paul says, no, this isn't imminent, but they'll ignore the, the very following verses where, yeah, but there's very specific stipulations that would make us think it's going to take a while. Now, Paul is not explicit with that, but given that he says all enemies have to be put under his feet, I think we would expect that expect to mean that's going to take quite a while before the general resurrection is going to happen. It's not this, oh yes, it's going to happen right away because all enemies are falling under his feet right now. No, I think the, even Paul talked about in his other letters being persecuted. He understood there were still enemies out there. I think Paul was hopeful that it could come much quicker. I think he mm. wanted it to come quicker for sure, but he still understood that Christ had to reign until all enemies were under his feet. So this is what I mean earlier. We're just ignoring what the actual context of this first fruits language is and not really taking the whole picture into context. Mm -hmm. All right, let's get to the next section here. We have uh, 11527 is the next time marker I have. And this is the uh, fail. Jesus was apparently a failed apocalyptic prophet, which I have a well, whole video well, on well, about can a year I, ago. Yeah, can, go I, ahead. can I add something? Yeah, yeah. I think I, I want people to understand also. So, you know, talking about 1 Corinthians 15, uh, the empty tomb, think about it logically, all right? Uh, I wrote in, in my series on my channel, The Bedrock Facts of the Resurrection. Just this is from my transcript. I, I basically said, um, according to the Gospels, the discovery of the empty tomb generally led to more puzzlement and confusion than belief. It was instead the appearances of the risen Jesus to the woman, Peter, the Twelve, and to Paul that led to their conviction that God raised him from the dead. Mm -hmm. The appearances then are the definitive evidence for resurrection for Jesus's resurrection, according to this creedal tradition, Paul and obviously the Gospels and the Psalms and Acts. Not the empty tomb. Yeah. <laughs> Think about it. Think about it logically. Why would an empty tomb be the icing on the cake as part of this? This is why we're Christians. Uh, because what's curious is that in the creed, and N.T. Wright actually brings this out, a lot of translations unfortunately don't have this, except for one that I I do personally use, and those who know me know that I use this translation. It's called the ISV, the International Standard Version. Mm, yeah. Um, people like David Allen Black and like very good scholars who have worked on the ESV and the NLT also worked on this new ISV. Now, the ISV puts it this way. Uh, let me actually share my screen so people can see it. Yeah, you got it. Um, because this is important. <laughs> It's this, because the Greek actually puts it this way, and it's, unfortunately, it's not presented in your common translations like NIV, ESV. So it says, the Messiah, oh, by the way, they, they translate Christos there as Messiah. So the Messiah died for our sins, according to the scriptures. He was buried. Okay, notice, he's buried. Mm -hmm. So genuine death here. He was raised on the third day, according to scriptures. Now, here's the bit that N.T. Wright argued for in all his works. And finally, they put it in translation. And is still alive. And he was seen by Cephas and all on goes. This still alive context is this notion of con a continual reality of the fact of his resurrection. It's not just he's just raised. There's this, it's like he's raised now forever. Mm -hmm. Why is this important? Because back in Mark 9, I'm just throwing an intertextual comparison. In Mark 9, when Jesus is transfigured, he comes down, says, Son of Man's going to die and then rise again. There's actually a debate happening in Mark 9 where the disciples are like, wait, what do you mean that a resurrection is going to happen? Isn't it going to, like, I'll, I'll actually read it out here. It says, they kept the matter to themselves, but argued about what this rising from the dead meant. So don't the scribes say that Elijah must come first? So here's the point. Resurrection in human history, the Jews thought, was an eschatological situation. At the end, the so-called day of resurrection, which Muslims use in their Quran, right? The day of resurrection. Jesus saying, yeah, I'm going to shock you guys that something's going to happen in time. 
something that you didn't expect before. And again, with a Christian theological point of view, if you believe in the supernatural, this is also to hoodwink, and this is Heiser's point in his work, it's to hoodwink Satan, like what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 2. He didn't know the plan, that no one knew the plan, so the cosmic forces don't know the plan, and so on. So, in conclusion, notice that 1 Corinthians 20 has a lot of the reason why the resurrection is important in the, in the sense that Jesus is still alive, to do what specifically? To destroy the arches and the authorities and the dynamis. You know, the, the, we're talking about the supernatural dimension here. It's not just dealing with the death issue that encompasses you and I as stardust, right? Like through evolution. Mm -hmm. we, are, we are the mortality and the stardust of this reality. In other words, we are at the bottom of the barrel. That's, but that's looking at it at a horizontal level. If you look at it at a vertical dimension, there's also, in regards to the end coming, which is what you're trying to point out, Mike, that the deliverance of to the kingdom of God is this notion that there's a vertical dimension of, of a cosmic drama that Jesus has to accomplish and solve yeah. in the death and resurrection. That's part of, of Paul's argument. It's not just... God decided to one day just drop down, become human. All right, let me show up. Okay, I'm dying to also resurrect. And that's about, you know, that's, no. The grand narrative is a lot larger than than anyone seems to realize. And, um, yeah. yeah. All right, let's get to the uh, Jesus claiming to be a failed apocalyptic prophet. This may be our last clip so that we can get to super chats here. Uh but they do go on a lot more. See the you know, the full documentary. You want to get their whole argument here. Uh, we're just going to play a short clip to sort of get the idea of what they're arguing here. And you too, J-Man. Your book has you saying the end would happen in the first century. Bullpucky. The Bible says no such thing. You said you had Bible verses, Satan. Yeah, show us. The Bible verses, Satan. I bet the seminary guy from Princeton has them. He just might. Dr. Allison, could you show us Bible verses where Jesus makes failed apocalyptic prophecies? Well, one is Mark 9, 1, which says uh, there are some standing here who will not taste death until they see the kingdom of God has come with power. There be some of them that stand here. Standing where? Standing here. Zip it, Satan. Keep it down. Okay, what about us? Some of you shall not taste of death till they have seen the kingdom of God come with power Ooh, and what happened next as would become something of a pattern for christian people going forward nothing happened the kingdom of god did not come with power okay so let me pull up my slides here uh, a lot i want to say on this now i did a video i said last march called was jesus a failed apocalyptic prophet where i went into a lot more detail Again, a lot of this stuff in this whole video, Satan's Guide to the Bible, I just sort of went through. Yeah, I already have a video on that. Yeah, I already have a video on that. Yeah, already, like same kind of stuff. It's like same with Eric. Yeah, this whole Thessalonians thing. Yeah, I got a video on that. So a lot of this stuff has been addressed in a lot more detail. Uh, let me share some slides from that uh, briefly here, and then I will go into it. So let's talk about whole, the whole Mark 9-1. One of the things that's not being noted is that all three synoptic gospels put this verse about some standing here will not taste test till they see the kingdom of God coming in power. They put it right before the transfiguration. So here's what Craig Keener says. He says, this verse points to the future glory mentioned in the preceding verses by way of anticipate, anticipatory re revelation of that glory they are to experience in 9, 2 to 13. Because the future Messiah had already come, the glory of his future kingdom was also already present. So we see this also in Paul. Romans 1, 3 says, he was declared to be the son of God in power according to the spirit of holiness by his resurrection from the dead. And N.T. Wright says about this, thus, though the word kingdom is not explicitly mentioned, the way in which this extract, whether original to Paul or quoting a pre-Pauline formula, claims the biblical language of kingship for Jesus and declares that this kingship is with power and for the sake of his name already indicates an answer to the question of Mark 9.1. And N.T. Wright says the answer is, yes, the kingdom has already come with power, when Jesus was raised from the dead and began to commission his emissaries to summon the nations to allegiance. So what, I, what the argument is, is that Jesus said they're going to see the end of the world coming. Well, no, that's not what Jesus meant. It meant about coming 
onto the earth to start spreading of the gospel, which we see beginning sort of initiate at the transfiguration and then beginning at uh, the resurrection itself. So the language itself, and I know Ben Witherington has also gone a lot into this, the language that we see in Matthew and Mark about this uh, kingdom language coming, the kingdom of God coming. Yes, it is about the kingdom of God coming from heaven to earth, but it's also realized in Jesus's resurrection, this idea that uh, his resurrection initiates the kingdom of God pouring out and spreading through over all the earth. Now, again, this ties into my post-millennialist convictions, but it doesn't necessarily imply that this means the end of the world is going to come. There's a pretty strong precedence in the New Testament and in early Christian writings that what the most likely understanding of this was is that this refers to Jesus bringing the kingdom of God through his resurrection, and then it's spreading to the believers. Then you have Pentecost, and then you have the new temple of God being the believers themselves, and that kingdom is what is growing. That is not necessarily referring to the end of all times. We in the modern era have misunderstood this language. So we can see some other points here. So another point to point out, though, is when Jesus uses a lot of the language he uses in the New Testament about I thought that said coming. Rob said. <laughs> <laughs> no, Rab said. The rabbi said is what the, I believe yeah. the quote is here from the, yeah, yeah. Uh, the text of the Sanhedrin. So what is happening when it comes to prophecy is, as I noted in my big, long video, prophecy is conditional. You can see places like Jeremiah 18. You can see the book of Amos for that. Uh when God utters a prophecy, there are implications already in Jesus's background in the Hebrew Bible that it can be delayed if the stipulations are not fulfilled. So this coming from the Talmud, it said all the predestined dates for redemption have passed and the matter now depends only on repentance and good deeds. Another says it is written in it in its time will the Messiah come. While it is also written, the Lord will hasten it. If they are worthy, though, I will hasten if I will hasten it. If not. It will come in its due time. So in ancient Jewish understanding of prophecy, it wasn't this idea that when God utters a prophecy, it's going to come at an exact time. It's conditional. Certain stipulations have to be fulfilled. Otherwise, the prophecy will be delayed. Okay. Here they brought up Dale Allison. But Dale Allison says in the end of the age has come on page 155, there are nevertheless a good many apocalyptic texts in which it is undoubtedly taught that the eschatological climax is contingent upon or at least will be hastened by the repentance of Israel. And he cites texts like the Testament of Dan, the Testament of Simeon, uh, the Assumption of Moses, Second Baruch, uh, Apocalypse of Abraham, uh, for Ezra, Psalms of Solomon, these kinds of ideas. He also says, Matthew 23 to 39, Luke 13, 35b, is a conditional prophecy in which exhibits a standard form found in declarations attributed in Sanhedrin 98a, as well as some others. What is Matthew 23, 39? Jesus says, for I tell you, you will not see me again until you say, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Okay, what is he getting at here? Basically, Jesus is saying, I will not return until Israel says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. If you go to Paul in Romans, he says, this has been delayed until the fullness of Gentiles comes in. So Jesus tells us flat out, his return is going to be delayed until Israel says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. This is in line with what Paul says in 1 Corinthians 15. He must reign until all enemies are under, under his feet. Then death will be destroyed. So a lot of times we read the imminence understanding of what we see in the prophecies in like the Olivet Discourse. And we go, aha, this means he's got to come back immediately. Ignoring the fact that places like Mark 13 says the gospel has got to be preached to all the nations. And Israel has got to declare Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. With that, it with those verses, in line with Jewish understanding of ancient prophecy being conditional, we should expect a delay because those things have not been met. Basically, what Jesus is sort of saying is like, you know, this is the quickest it could happen, but these things got to happen. If they didn't happen, in line with the background like Jeremiah 18, there should be a delay in the prophecy. And I cover this in a lot more detail in my video. But this idea that Jesus taught imminence. Well, he also taught delay. Now, they'll say, but what about the imminence, these utter destruction type things happening? Well, also in Matthew 23, Jesus says the blood of all the prophets shall be poured out on this generation. So he does speak of imminence happening, and we see that happening in the destruction of the temple at 70 AD with the Jewish war. But the other part of the prophecy, the part about the return of the Son of Man, that is delayed 
unless Israel says, blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. That has not happened. Therefore, there is going to be a delay. Paul says he's got to reign till all enemies are under his feet. That has not happened. We should expect a delay. So yeah, you can look at certain passages and go, aha, we look at just these certain verses. Jesus is clearly saying imminence. It's going to happen now. But you're ignoring the background about prophecy is always expected to be conditional. And you're ignoring the fact that Jesus did put in certain stipulations that have to be fulfilled on mankind's part for the fullness of the prophecy that happened. If those are not met, delay is going to follow. So that there's a lot of this just oversimplifying in this video of prophecy itself. It's not so much this idea that prophecy is like fatalism. When Jesus says it's going to happen, it's going to happen. Just like, no, it's always conditional in the Jewish scriptures, or at least for the most part, from what I can gather. So a lot to be said there. Now, I will, after this, I'm going to link all of these videos down below uh, so you guys can check them out for further research. Swelling stuff from Eric and Rob. Anything you guys want to add on the whole issue of prophecy since I've been rambling on for a little bit there? Yeah, I, like Eric, go for it, but, but I, I definitely want to share on Mark 9 one as well. Yeah, go oh, for it, but go for it. Yeah. yeah, I don't have much to say. I, I was just going to say I agree. I mean, even going back to Mark's gospel, he talks about keeping watch because <clears throat> you don't know whether it's evening, midnight, when the rooster crows or at dawn. And I mean, you look at the parables in Matthew 25, there is this repeated theme of like, hey, guys, uh, what's the whole parable of the, the ten virgins about? Like, when is the bridegroom going to come? And it could be like... <clears throat> whenever but there's this there's this feature of like possible delay and it, it could be a while to the point where these other virgins are, are running out of their oil and the whole point is to to stay ready um because you, this this could take a while so yeah no i was just agreeing with you and just adding those parables um as as something that also we shouldn't just kind of like discount and even take his later editions because we even see this beginning to uh be spelled out at the end of the Olivet Discourse in Mark. Yeah, it's it's pretty clear there are stipulations in Jesus's prophecy that have to be fulfilled before the Son of Man would return. In line with the conditional nature of Jewish prophecy, a delay is just going to have to happen. So, again, uh, what, uh, go ahead, Rob. What did you want to add to this? Well, I, so I'm a partial preterist, but that's here and there. Uh, don't worry, I'm for me as, as a yeah. We're, you're you're um, you're in, you're in you're company, company of other partial preterism. yeah 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 <laughs> I'm, par I'm partial to preterism <laughs> okay now ip you're bringing on michael bird right i'm bringing on michael bird yeah next week i can't wait we're going to talk about how the new testament ex early christians taught jesus as god and it's just very clearly there excellent excellent now michael bird is a fellow aussie so he'll he'll do good now <laughs> michael bird wrote a whole paper for SBL on Mark 9-1. And I've quoted, now, another commentary I wrote is on Mark. <laughs> wait a so. minute, wait a minute, Rob. <laughs> the documentary we're responding to said SBL is all these scholars who just aren't yeah. going to support biblical like, oh, and traditional Michael reading. Bird actually me that. Michael yeah. Bird himself makes a cameo appearance in the documentary. So I know. <laughs> it's like, he's like this conservative yeah. evangelical scholar, yet he's writing for SBL. Okay. Now, Remember, just I can't believe we we're actually discussing this because just a moment ago I connected Mark nine to First Corinthians fifteen. Now Mark nine one is sort of emotional. To, I, I get emotional about it, especially when I was writing. Like I was pulling in data on that, and because the more I focus on the cross of Christ, okay, the whole issue of being Christian is the significance of the cross. Uh, we 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 are in too much in these discussions and debates and so on. We are robbing ourselves from say the uh, the original ventures into the the typology and significance and theology of the cross that that say from the reformation onwards has always focused on as that image that grotesque image is also our salvation now michael bird says this in his conclusion of the paper which i put in the in my commentary on mark so he says mark's gospel is fundamentally an apology for the cross. Now, now remember, Mark is the, as even Bart Ehrman would argue, Mark is the first gospel that's written, depending on if you believe in Q's existence or not. But the point is, Mark is the first gospel. Therefore, Mark has an emphasis on how he's going to reveal this cross-like language. This documentary 
for some reason, and even Bart Ehrman himself, which kind of blows my mind, has completely gone against the the con the consensus now of what Mark Nine One is actually speaking about. It's talking yeah. about the cross. Like I was shocked to see Bart Ehrman go that direction, you know. Otherwise, so Bert says. By the same token, the relevance of this proposal also impacts readings of Mark's eschatology. Mark as apocalyptic has become a vogue position in the last few years. This is true insofar as it explains the cosmic plot of Mark's gospel, which com commences and concludes with tearings of the heavens. So remember, Mark 1, the baptism, Mark 15, the tearing of the veil in, in the temple. The story unravels for the unfolding drama of God's triumph through Christ over evil, for the anticipated power of the age to come has has come, but in the midst of apparent weakness. Yet paradoxically, it remains the climax of divine power as it affects the salvation of the elect and the condemnation of the wicked. Concurrently, this salvation is incomplete and awaits consummation. And that's basically your point that you're trying to make. Thus, the cross also foreshadows the materialization of the salvation and judgment, which will eventuate when the Son of Man returns, not in veiled power, that is what we see on the cross, but invisible power that Jesus promised the Sanhedrin in Mark 14. This, you'll see the Son of Man coming on the clouds. You know, the, the, basically, he's a, he's the second power on the right side of the first power, the two powers in heaven theology in Mark 14. So this, this explains why language so indica indicative of the parousia is used to describe the crucifixion in Mark 9.1. Though the crucifixion is the antithesis of human power, it calls attention to the final elim elimination of evil at the return of the Son of Man. And so, based on what Bird said there, again, I put this together, showcasing the parallels now. Now notice, Mark 9.1 is speaking about some of you here will not die, right? And then you'll see the Son of Man coming in his glory and so on. What does that look like? Well, notice the parallels. Unearthly light, supernatural darkness. Clothes are luminous, clothes are stripped off. Two Old Testament saints, two criminals. Conversation with Elijah, apparent conversation with Elijah. Disciples are present, disciples flee. God speaks, God is silent. You see, that this is Mark as an author where it comes full circle. Yeah. So he's put this narrative together. The finality is Mark 15. And then I would... I would, I would also venture to say, verse 8, I'm complete, I'm actually happy it ends at verse 8, because 9 to 20 would communicate to me, oh yeah, now, now we're going into just trying to smooth out the, you know, no, but if it ends abruptly at verse 8, that's important, because resurrection is on, already uh, preserved in verse 7, you know, go to Peter especially and tell that he's risen. Verse 8 is abrupt because it communicates this urgency of, wait, is this, is this like, like what Tolkien would communicate? A you catastrophe? Something like, a, like it's out of this catastrophe, something joyful has, has transpired. That is, and, 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 in, and in Mark and scholarship, they call this Mark and intercalation. So the sandwiching techniques of Mark to abruptly end at verse 8, and to have the systematic notion of the cross coming through, absolutely brilliant as far as storytelling is concerned. Now, how on earth is this anything to do with the second coming of Christ? And that apparently it failed in the first century and all that, you know, it, it you're ignoring, well, Bart Ehrman, because he's relying on Bart Ehrman, is, is ignoring the consensus of scholarship from 2005 onwards on this issue. Yeah, I mean, I've seen him do that for with like earlier in Matthew. He says Matthew wrote two donkeys, and that's that's really fallen out of favor and been critiqued a lot lately. It's still, you know, it's this case. All right, so that's Satan's Guide to the Bible. Look, we couldn't address everything in it. It's long. There's a lot of fluff. There's a lot of things we're not even going to try to defend, like inerrancy. Uh, and there's just a lot of, but I mean, I think we tried to hit the main points there. As we noted, there's a lot of problems. It's not, it is presenting a one sided view. It is presenting things in a very uncharitable way, like when it comes to evidence for the Exodus or issues with regards to the alleged failed prophecies of Jesus. A lot of these things, there's a much, there's a lot better stuff out there uh, that actually goes more into this and presents an alternative understanding. We just want you encouraged to take a look at. So, all right, with that, 
Uh, I'm going to dive into Super Chats. If any of my two guests need to uh, take off at any point, you're welcome to. But I'm going to start going through these. There are some questions in here, I think, for you guys as well, though. So I need a Scott uh, refill, that's for sure. <laughs> there you go. <laughs> Wow, Satan's Guide is dishonest. Shocker. Yeah, it's again, it's aptly named. It's going to be, it's, it's filled with lies. As Rob pointed out, it misrepresents Deuteronomy 7. It represents, misrepresents 1 Corinthians 15. M misrepresents a lot of the, I would say, the state of where conservative scholars are on these things. Um, blessings from Metonia on Discord. How should we go about educating the church about the Old Testament so they aren't surprised this kind of, po of polemical video? Uh, I'll quickly say, and then uh, Rob obviously is reaching for something here. I will quickly say, just talk to them about it. I mean, it's all in the Bible. Just read the Bible. Like, we're not hiding any of this stuff. The church has never been hiding any of this stuff. They, they put this stuff in the Bible, and there's been scripture readings in the church for generations. Uh, and there's a lot of really good books. So talk about this. Talk about what scholars say about it. You know, with like uh, Psalm 137, I mean, just know, like, hey, this isn't coming from God. There, there's interesting psychology here that we're supposed to learn about with what's going on with the Israelites. There's nothing to be scared of. What did you want to say, Rob? Was you reaching through your bookshelf? First and foremost, it's an abomination knowing IPs here. It's an abomination not to read this. <laughs> yeah, that's true. If you want you catastrophe Tolkien's uh, beautiful polemics using Christian theology, that's the first and foremost reading you should do. But in regards to the Old Testament, behind mm. the scenes of the Old Testament, a fantastic yeah, work, a uh, compilation of a lot of editors, uh, but Walton being one, John Hilbert as well. You you need you just just invest yourself in good resource. This 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 is legit stuff. Okay, this is not you know amateur stuff. This is legit stuff. Finally, if you want to bridge Old Testament into an intertestamental second temple flavor coming into the new testament mike heiser's book reversing hermon notice the you uh, keep you keep coming on my channel promoting this whole reading of genesis 6 1 to 4 that it's fallen yes. angels and i'm like you know i don't take no, 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 that no, no 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 apart okay i putting that aside the point is <laughs> the put, putting that aside the point is if you want an, uh, a flavor of, see, Enoch, the Watchers, and Jesus. So if you want a flavor of Heiser pulling the scholarship that's that's connected New Testament thinking into Second Temple thinking into, say, going into that Babylonian, like, like say, Daniel's position, Ezekiel's position, back then into the Old Testament period, this book, I haven't seen any other book do that. And so that book is a recommendation. I, except for the fact that I respect IP's position because I'm still wrestling with that Nephilim discussion, yeah. but that's but that's a whole different topic. So yeah, I take yeah. a more human approach to that one. All right, yeah. glad I could catch this one. Thanks for your work. Appreciate that, stranger. Thank you for the super chat. We only have a Protestant scholarship in the doc. I'm not sure what you're referring to. I mean, uh, you're muted, oh, Eric. You're, you're muted. No. Yeah. Come on, Eric. Get your act together here. In the document, they refer to basically biblical scholarship starting from protestantism because of a belief mm. in sola scriptura um and so i think he's just kind of complaining that that was one-sided because because we think in terms of sola scriptura mm. we're going to take a different way that we explore the text and all that other stuff i don't know um I, I don't know why they decided to do that that's a question for satan so give <laughs> give give satan an email or some well anyway i will say to give satan's thing a little credit you know there's only so much you can do yeah. in something a documentary so i will i will say that i just don't think it was presented in a fair light a video where satan brainwashes a group of children with lies and manipulation sounds about right yeah i know it's just sometimes the jokes write themselves ladies and gentlemen yeah what is this the babylon b over here <laughs> <laughs> thank you for gifting 20 inspiring philosophy memberships i have no idea what that means or who they go to i guess you decide. I appreciate that yeah, I, I don't understand how this works, but I, um, I think that's awesome. Maybe you could just grab them. They're just gifted and out into the ether and anyone can take one. Thank you as well, Brian, for gifting a membership. Uh, Bart Ehrman is not a historian on the top of that. Uh, Bart Ehrman is not a historian. And on top of that, arguing in very bad faith and it's showing. His approach to history insults first semester students. Now, I would disagree. Last footnote, only Muslim. I, he is an historian. 
there's a lot I disagree with, but I think he's at least due that respect that, you know, he did earn the degrees and he does write in history. Uh, I think some of his arguments are a little, a little like make my eyebrows raise, like his whole approach to saying Matthew says Jesus wrote in two donkeys is a little ridiculous. Yeah, that's ridiculous. Uh, I mean, another really quick example um, that Ehrman kind of pulls is like in John two eleven, uh, he talks about, this was the first of his signs that Jesus did. And he, he leaves out this bit about Cana and Galilee. This is in his, um, which book is it? Uh, misquoting Jesus, I, I think. I don't know. Uh, and then John 2, 23, it says, now at the Passover feast, many believed in his name when they saw the signs he was doing. He leaves out the facts that it was in Jerusalem. And then John 4, 54, it says, now this was the second sign that Jesus did. And then he kind of goes, well, how many signs did he do? Um, but he he like leaves different parts of the text out and then he claims that John is contradicting himself. And so I do think Bart, I don't really care if this gets me in hot water, uh, is snaky at times. I think he manufactures contradictions where there aren't none. And I even had in my discussion with Matthew Harkey, who's a great guy. I enjoy him. Um, he would totally disagree with us on the whole uh, Jesus being a failed apocalyptic prophet thing. And he has a, a mm -hmm. video on that. Um, but he was willing to say like, hey, Bart does throw out a lot of crappy apparent contradictions that are just garbage that he sh shouldn't even use. And so um, I, I think anybody with paying attention realizes kind of what he's up to at times. I'm not saying he's totally a bad scholar, but you have to cross check everything that he says. Yeah. I mean, I still respect him, but again, a lot of, a lot of disagree was there. Just, just, just to clarify in his very latest work on Paul in Acts 17, I forgot the title of the work. Like, I think it was like a 2020 publication. I am noticing an evolution in Bart's thinking here. So he is a scholar. Okay. He's a legitimate yeah. scholar in regards to histories of Jesus, especially against say Muslims, uh, you know, the no crucifixion arguments. All well and good in, in that front. The snaky comment, I'll sort of nuance that, but I, I do agree with you, Eric. I, in the sense that I'm confused. Uh, I remember this. I, I, I actually watch a lot of his public lectures. Like, he gives some, in fact, he even gave oh, yeah. lectures at churches sometimes. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Um, I enjoy his lectures. <laughs> I think he's yeah. a really good speaker. Yeah. The great, I, I'm a subscriber of the great courses. He is a prominent speaker of the Great Courses. Okay. Now, what's fascinating to me is that during the QA section, I remember at one particular lecture, he, he was asked about the Son of Man in Mark 14, for example. Like, is this the deed? Is this communicating deity of Christ? Bart Ehrman goes, Maybe I don't know. I just don't know the passage well. I don't know the, say, the Second Temple discussions and all that. But yeah, it's a very complicated passage. I don't know. He may not be arguing for that. Now, by the way, when he says he, he, what he's saying is the author of the gospel, it may not be argued for that. In his work since how Jesus became God, he then goes into territory that, for example, Second Temple scholarship, which hires a site, where it's just a given. Like the Enoch seminar, for example, it's just a given. Son of Man language is all to do with that second person figure of, the, of what then becomes Trinity and so on. And Bart clarifies and says, you know what? Yeah, there's an exaltation. Jesus is claiming to be a type of second Yahweh. Great. But then just two or three weeks ago, he was on Cosmic Skeptics channel. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't know if you saw that, but so Cosmic Skeptic asked Bart in Mark I 2, responded to that on I responded to that on TikTok. Yeah. <laughs> Oh, okay, okay. So, yeah, like, where, you know, uh, which is easy to say uh, that your sins are forgiven or pick up your mat and walk. Now, obviously, the rhetorical question is anyone can just blurt out, oh, your sins are forgiven. I could say that, but that doesn't ver verify if I'm actually God and flesh that can actually forgive sins in the, in the supernatural sense, spiritual sense, because Jesus does the act, which is the hardest saying, to verify that he does have the authority to forgive sins. And the passage, the passage actually includes the Son of Man phrase in it. But Bart Ehrman is like, dude, you just contradicted your work. You just published two, three years ago when you've now you've yeah. concluded Son of Man language is deity language. And now you're saying, oh, no, no, Jesus just, is just 
It's just priestly. That doesn't in. mean he's. Yeah, yeah. It, it's just like so. That's just a nuanced snake language. That's what I've been mm. noticing with this one. Yeah, yeah, that's. I would. I would agree. It's. it's yeah, that bothers me. Yeah, back and forth. Yeah. Yeah, I'll have Michael Bird on my channel next week. Jesus clearly says he is God. It, it's hard to deny that. All right. Uh, Ecclesiastes says, "Too bad the truth travelers at a slow. Too bad the truth travels at a slow pace, like honey or maple syrup. I in lies travel like." A cut with blood and alcohol mix that rushes out. Yeah, I, I, I agree. I mean, this is just a, a reoccurring problem. I mean, when I deal with Muslims, they continue to try to make these really bad arguments that, like, the Bible says Rebecca was three when she married Isaac, and I still have to correct that. And it's just people like something sensationalist. When it comes to yeah. this, it's far more sensationalist that the Bible is an error and the exodus didn't happen, and oh my goodness, Jesus made a failed prophecy, than the actual nuance around these things and where. It's a much more fun thing to read than, oh, let me explain the nature of conditional prophecy in the Bible and how it relates. So, yeah, unfortunately, the truth does travel slower. Yeah. Let me read a real quick quote on that line. Um, this is uh, George Horn, this is a 19th century uh, uh, Anglican guy. Um, he says, pertness, pertness and ignorance may ask a question in three lines, which it will cost learning and ingenuity 30 pages to answer. When this is done, the same question shall be triumphantly asked again the next year as if nothing had ever been written on the subject. And as for people in general, for one reason or another, like short objections better than long answers. In this mode of disputation, if it can be styled as such, the odds may ever be against us. And we must be content with those of our friends who have honesty and erudition, candor and patience to study both sides of the question, be it so. And so uh, porn was a prophet. If he could just see the days of TikTok, he would roll over in his grave, I'm sure. But yeah. Yeah. I just want to uh, clarify book. Rebecca's age, just as a side point. Rebecca's age <laughs> in the Book of Jubilees is is twenty years old. Uh, but she well, married, you not. you need to get the lying Dawa version of that Book of oh, Jubilees. It's Dawa. three. So, okay. so a second uh, temple text before the Talmud says twenty, not three. <laughs> so, <laughs> a book on reading the New Testament like the original audiences. What are your guys' thoughts on this? like the original audience um i mean i think i know what you're going to say ip is maybe misreading scripture and westernized what, westernized uh, kenneth bailey's got some good books on that like yeah. jesus through middle eastern eyes paul through mediterranean eyes yeah i mean it just helps you understand the cultural context david de silva's book honor patronage kinship also a great book uh i mean yeah. i mean anything I, I by people, de silva in my opinion he's yeah. a fantastic like yeah, as it, far as New Testament it, goes, yeah. and he helped me with my videos. I did on, uh, I did one on honor and shame uh, a year and a half ago. I did one <coughs> on page for client system called ancient relationships, cultural context of the Bible. He helped with both of those videos. So, yeah, he's got some great stuff. Check out those. But a good place to start for a layman would be misreading scripture with Western eyes. It's just a great book to sort of start to understand how we keep importing our own ideas onto the text and why we should minimize that. So. Does minimal facts work? Eric oh, demand. Facts. Demand is just, he's just, he's just trying to set up. He's trying to get me to fight somebody, I think. No. Okay. Very <laughs> super in brief. This is my objection to the minimal facts argument. I'm sure people have heard it and they're tired of hearing it at this point because I'm told that we're like CrossFitters and uh, vegans. We just got to tell everybody that they're wrong. <laughs> Cameron, if you're watching, you're probably not, but no, I'm just, I'm just teasing. Uh, basically, in brief, my problem with the minimal facts argument is that it relies too much on uh, Paul. And Paul tells mm -hmm. us about the appearances, but he just gives us brief mentions of the appearances. Paul also, of course, met with the apostles and the apostles affirmed his doctrine. And Paul was obviously preaching resurrection. Problem with this is that without knowing what the details, the details of te their testimony, it's hard to really affirm strongly that the disciples were rational in believing in the appearances. And so um, the reason why I don't like minimal facts is you, you can't get the details. You can throw all kinds of appearances into the mix uh, that are compatible with minimal facts um, that aren't like strongly evidential. And so I think you need the details from the gospels um, where they ate with Jesus, they touched Jesus, they spent 40 days with him. They were polymodal, multi-sensory, experiences that were extended across time. Um, and so I think we need to be able to bring in those details, at least go back to what the original eyewitnesses claimed. 
Um, and then we need to bring in the content because they're not going to be mistaken about that. And then we need to bring the content uh, or the context of their claims, which I, I think a, a more maximalist approach is more effective in that because we can bring an even stronger argument for the persecution that they brought forth these claims uh, to, you know, in a hostile audience using the book of Acts. And so, yeah. yeah, that's, that's kind of it in a nutshell. We need details. Anytime you get a miracle report, what do we need to know in order to know that that person is rational and reporting uh, a miracle and they're not just mistaken details. And without any details, I don't think minimal facts works for that particular reason. You're going to need to bring in more. I don't, I don't think we need to worry about it. I mean, the gospels are eyewitness accounts. I mean, yeah. I'm, 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 I'm throwing the gauntlet down. I will have videos on that this summer arguing that Mark came from Peter. Matthew uh, came from Matthew. Luke spoke with eyewitnesses and John came from the beloved disciple, John. So right. I and that throw the, down the gauntlet this summer. And, and that the claims in those gospels are not just eyewitness accounts, but they represent the unembellished testimony of what the disciples claim to have seen. And so now we got to ask, why are they making these claims to such a hostile audience? Can, can I can I just quickly suggest? I, I hear you. In fact, I, I I don't like again these labels. Like here's a minimal facts argument. <coughs> but let's just again thought experiment. I would personally convert to Christianity if I were to bump into Paul's. Let's just say, and obviously we're bumping into his writings. And let's just also go down with the liberal view of just uh, say Romans, First, Second Corinthians, and Galatians. Just those four. That's enough for me to convert. Here's why: because Paul's psychology is very interesting. He goes out of his way to fight the church because, think about it: Yahweh becomes a man and dies on a Roman cross. That is nonsense. But that's how he starts his first chapter of Corinthians. What is nonsense in the world? God used what is just, what would blow your mind. Like, that's how he did it? Yeah, that's his power and his wisdom. He brings about power and wisdom through that. Now, notice that Corinthians also has the Passover language mentioned there, right? This is my body. This is the bread. Now, notice, if I become a Christian just based on his conversion as being a genuine experience, then when I navigate outside Paul, so first Peter one speaks about where Peter says, Hey, we were witnesses of his glory. Oh yeah. That's a transfiguration. So there's another data point you can add. What about say now the gospel narratives as IP is pointing out, you know, like Luke starts with this investigation that he did and obviously starting with Mark as the base layer. Oh boy. Then it accumulates. Then we also have to, Think about the fact that they're writing on top of a massive tome called the Old Testament, that somehow that has its finality in this, because that's how Mark's gospel starts. This is now the, the beginning of the good news of Jesus, right? So, yeah, that, that's I, how I would approach this. I would say that I would bring in Paul's conversion as part of the priors. Um, and I would also bring in the Old Testament, especially Old Testament prophecy, pointing to Jesus to raise the priors as well. I'm kind of weird. I'm like a maximalist maximalist. I'm going to bring modern day miracles uh, to raise the priors as well. Uh, and then I'm going to bring in the gospels uh, and the apostiori, apostiori, whatever you know. I'm trying to say. Uh, I'm going to mix all of that together. And so I'm not saying I wouldn't convert just on the basis of Paul's writings alone, even though you're going to look in vain for a conversion like his uh, in any of the literature at all. And, and I'm not saying that's not significant. I think that it is significant, but even with Paul's conversion, if we can bring in a maximalist kind of approach with Paul's conversion and bring in the details of acts that he actually was blinded for several days, that somebody else heard a voice prayed for him. And like, there's these, again, more sensory details. Uh, I think that's even better. And, and so that's, that's um, how I became Christian, by the way. So my mm -hmm. playlist, uh, what does God want is a summarization of my personal testimony. All right, you two. Exactly, break it up. Break exactly it up. how you just broke it down. That's how I became a Christian. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, yeah. IP, where does it say John used a scribe? Well, I don't think it says somewhere that John used a scribe. I argued from cultural context that this is just the way ancient people wrote. And you can make a, a circumstantial case from the Meritorian fragment that it mentions that when John wrote, there were other brothers there with them. So and it's not arguing that it's explicitly says John used a scribe. It's pointing out that this was the cultural context. And if John was illiterate, it would have been a problem. He could use a scribe. Not, not much of an issue there. 
Dan M said that Exodus 22 is copied from the Code of Hammurabi. Who cares? That would not bother me at all. I mean, like, again, see my video, The Misunderstood Mosaic Law. I'd be perfectly fine with that. I mean, I, I think that would actually support a much even earlier date if that was the case. Uh, so, yeah, I don't see that as much as a problem. Um, here's a, my favorite comment. Post mail is mental gymnastic. You're adding to the text. Okay. <laughs> see my video, The End Times, A New Perspective. No, it's not. There's a lot of good scriptures that support a post mill understanding. I said one, 1 Corinthians 15, uh, Mark 4 with the, uh, the growing of the mustard seed, Daniel with the mountain spreading over the kingdom, Ezekiel, his tree, uh, Ezekiel's well with the water coming from the altar and going to make the whole sea uh, fresh water. I mean, there's a lot of good scriptures that do support a post mill. I'll just say, I'm not even post mill, um, but I'm, I'm open. You know, I'm, hey, I'm no just kind perfect. of... I'm right. I'm undecided, but post mill absolutely has scriptures. And I would say post mill has probably better support than Amil um, does. Amil is kind of, anyway, we don't have to get into that, but no, that's, he's not adding to the text. It's a totally defensible reading. And I'm saying this is somebody who's not committed to that view at all. I had someone bug me about the failed prophecy on my last stream. They dismissed the transfiguration as Jesus flying around with some dead dudes. I mean, okay. <laughs> sure, I, I can mock anything I want to if I really felt like it, you know, like that's when it when they don't have an argument, and they resort to mockery. To yeah, you know, the supernatural doesn't happen. And so you, you're stupid. Shut up, Christians. Hurt, 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 you know, like great. Do any of you study the Bible in Greek like Ehrman? I guess he's arguing that uh, uh, because we don't know Greek. I'm trying like, to learn. I just, I just keep losing the time for it. Yeah, I would like to learn too, but that's just kind of like, you know, you Christians, you can't interpret, tell us about the Quran because you don't read it in Arabic. It's just like, no, <laughs> but N.T. Wright reads the Bible in Greek and he comes com to complete uh, opposite conclusions as Ehrman. So now what? The, we, yeah, should I uh, can read it to in Greek? Wait. Should I become a disciple of James White because he teaches Greek? I mean, no, I'm not going to do that. I disagree with James White on plenty of things. Except for post. Yeah, I, I, I'll, just, I'll just also point out that, that the scholars themselves, like when I mentioned Philip Comfort, the scholars themselves have made tools for those who are interested, who don't have the time to learn. Or maybe, I suppose, in time they start to learn. So me personally, I'm interested in the languages. It's not my focal point, but... Because I, I'm mature enough, hello, I'm mature enough and old enough to know that I can't just make, as IP has seen on TikTok <laughs> in many of the shorts I've seen, just these radical out there statements that people make. You know, like, for example, Jesus means hail Zeus in some of those TikTok <laughs> videos. Um, no, yeah, I did that one. Take the time to money out of your own pocket, invest in resources like lexicons and or interlinear lexicons. So Logos, for example, is brilliant with because of its efficiency and speed to highlight, okay, here's a Greek term and oh, here's a slight little spelling difference and here's a textual difference here. And, and just with a sense of a couple of brain cells, you can go, oh, I see where this is going in the augmentation, even though I may not specialize in a language. That is the sensible thing to do if you're not a specialist in this field. Just I'll jump ahead to this one and then jump back. My cousin Derek reads the Bible in Greek and he's on our side. So the ball's back in Eddie's court. Boom. Boom. Took him down right there. All right, Eric, I want you to calm yourself down here. Don't Tim McGrew's a snake watches debate with Ehrman. You really think your boy came out ahead in that one? I I, I would just beg to differ. And so tell me where the dishonesty is. I can point it out with Bart. Show me where the dishonesty is with Tim. All right. Uh, will you ever do videos criticizing Unitarianism? Well, I just did kind of one Friday. I showed the early church taught the Trinity through and through. And I will, but I'm going to do more videos showing that the New Testament teaches Trinitarianism. Therefore, Unitarianism just doesn't follow from the text. So I will do more on that. Uh, thank you for Wookie. Nice name. But he also added, can Rob expound further on on the arguments for why Daniel chapter seven would precede first Enoch rather than the other way around. Uh, yeah, go ahead, Rob. Uh, give a couple minutes on that one. Yeah, yeah, I'll, I'll be brief. Basically, Baal cycle. There's a particular scholar. I, I forget his name. Uh, Kanag, I think is the surname. But basically, it's called the roots of apocalyptic is his particular work of, of 
one of those classic works that has then opened the door for scholars since to navigate that. The point is, ancient Near Eastern legendary material of El, Baal, that religion, at the forefront of Daniel 7, so Daniel's using that imagery, just as Ezekiel uses the wheels within wheels, which is this Babylonian zodiac imagery of Marduk and the cycles of time. So Daniel does the same thing. Interestingly, there's mention of wheels there too in Daniel 7 with the court. Enoch, the, the, the debate is, is first Enoch a bridge to, and it, especially in this work, as Heiser points out, is Enoch a bridge to the up, what's called the Apkalu myth? Now, Amar Anas released a paper in 2010 called On the Origin of the Watchers. Now, Daniel 4 introduces this peculiar group called the Watchers, they're part of the council. And then chapter 7, those Watchers become sort of like insignificant in light of the massive court that sits at, at, between the Ancient of Days and the Son of Man. Enoch goes out of its way to describe Enoch's adventures in that discussion. Therefore, as Charlesworth points out, who's coming first when you when you do the uh, when you do the comparison down at the linguistic level? When you do the comparison with maybe word power, like like are there play, is this a type of plagiarism at play? The analysis has been done that Enoch is late fourth century BCE. The next question is: Is Enoch using Daniel or Daniel using Enoch? If Daniel's using Enoch, fantastic for the Maccabean theory, because now, if Daniel 7 is Maccabean, the whole book is Maccabean. But as mm -hmm. I pointed out, Daniel 7 is a lynch that connects all the other chapters. And if Daniel 7 itself is pre-Maccabean, or in this case, pre-Enochian, oops, now you have to explain the, the skeletal structure as hinging on chapter 7, which then I'm also open to this cleaning up process maybe or like a redaction process that leads to this maccabean date so and, and just quickly in conclusion you know the dates like the 2300 figure in daniel 8 or the 1290 figure or the 1333 figure in daniel 12 or the 70 weeks those are calculations that for example michael siegel at like literally not even like six months ago published a very fascinating study using Qumran, the Damascus document with uh, the timing of the sacrifices and all that, with those figures to suggest that this is all, this is to do with the Antiochus Epiphanes situation happening. Um, and, and therefore, but, but what's curious is that the 490 years of the 70 weeks transpires between uh, the decree uh, to rebuild the temple up to, so that would be in the 450s BC period, up to 33 AD, if you do the calculation, which is a little bit, again, spooky, because notice that you require a 6th century BC author for that to work. In other words, to know about the inauguration of the temple and so on, to give that particular figure. And to land at the time, the very day, in fact, I'll be that much audacious about this, the very day of his crucifixion, the the 490 years lands on the 3rd of April, 33 AD. So how do you, how, like, like, did the Maccabean author put that together to make it work out and for the calculations to work out, which is in the literature? Well, that's one hell of a hap happenstance on the Maccabean, the author's part. But that's if, uh, this whole discussion debate, that's if it depends on if it's post-Enoch or pre-Enoch. If it's pre-Enoch, it's Daniel the prophet, and he predicted accurately. If it's post Enoch, then some Maccabean author had one hell of an imagination to and and a a, a a library to encompass Mesopotamian myths, the Baal cycle, to know what's happening in in the in the in the period itself, and to make future predictions of Rome and the crucifixion of the Messiah. Mm -hmm. I had two gripes with the guide. A, it acts as though there are no scholarly answers to their point. Yeah, that's kind of what we were pointing out. It, B, it poisons the well by claiming that all pastors know there's irreconcilable issues with the Bible, implying that they're grifting. Yeah, that was another issue. I mean, it's it, it just, again, it's it, atheist. When you guys see yourself being portrayed by the Babylon Bee, I see you guys get angry about it. And sometimes I, have, I agree with you. 
Yeah, and I, I see atheists now, and I'm getting mad about the devil's guy going, what's wrong? Don't you get the joke? No, I don't, because, you know, you're not, it's not being directed towards you. So, you know, maybe you should try to think more outside of the box. But, yeah, I would agree with this entirely. Uh, um, so Jesus can show up to Paul, but not to us. Well, no one says he can't. He just doesn't need to. So uh, Jesus shows up to who he chooses to. It is not for us to demand that he is God, not us. You could just evaluate the testimony that we do have. And based on Eddie's other comments here, he's spending a lot of money to tell us that he hasn't he can, very well. He can send in all the money he, he can, wants. Can, <laughs> keep it flowing, bro. We got it. <laughs> we got. It's a billion dollar industry, and you're just funneling more in, buddy. My, my billion dollar industry. Yes. I, yeah. <laughs> my house with cracks in the walls. <laughs> yeah. My my minivan with two hundred thousand miles on it. N.T. Wright was asked to debate Airman. He said no. Why? Because he's scared. N.T. Wright is scared. There's no other explanation. It can't be because he's he doesn't like to do that or he's busy. The only explanation, Eddie, is that he's terrified. It's the only thing we can think. It's a massive conspiracy. You got us. That's right. Actually, I, I have a funny story on. <laughs> I have the audio clip. N.T. Wright was asked, are you aware of Richard Carrier's the history of Jesus, that, that myth book that he released in 2014. And she right goes, who's Richard Carrier? <laughs> <laughs> Interesting. Uh -oh. <laughs> Bart asked Tim, does the Bible have errors? He dodged for five minutes. Then he, that he then said, John could have snuck in and heard Jesus conversation with Pilate. Uh, again, I listened to that debate a long time ago. I don't know the specifics. I need to go back and listen to get a better case. Okay. Yeah, his wife is not even an is goes out of her way to say that she's not uh, an inerrantist, and she has a whole playlist of particular parts of the Gospels that she thinks there are actual genuine contradictions, um, or at least candidates for contradictions. And so I don't know if Tim has the same view now or not. I don't know. Um, and so I don't remember him saying anything about John sneaking in and hearing. Jesus's convo with Pilate, dude. You got my YouTube channel. Give me the timestamps. Show me the information. Uh, you know that's fine. If that's if that's what he said, then I don't know if I would agree with that. But we do have plenty of reasons that, like the disciples, were in on some uh, had sources that were in on some 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 conversations. I mean, you have in Acts, it talks about that Manan worked in Herod's household. You also have Joanna, who was the wife of Husa, which was Herod's household manager, um, which does explain probably why we know the, the conversation uh, about Herod saying, hey, what's up with Jesus? And how are these powers working in him? Is he John the Baptist raised from the dead? Said he said it right to his servants. And so there, there could be other similar situations going on there. I don't know. Um, we're not going to always have the answer to every single question. Um, we have lots of, of explanations uh, for, for this particular one. So why couldn't it be something similar? I mean, it's, it's, it, it's, it was a debate. I'm not going to sit here and try to like pick sides uh, with something I don't even remember, but all right, that's the end of the super chats, everyone. So again, subscribe to my guests below. I appreciate everyone coming. Uh, that's Satan's guide to the Bible. And those are the problems with it. Uh, later, I will put links to the videos down below so you guys can check out the stuff we referenced throughout. All right. With that, I'm going to close this out. Thank you for coming, everyone. We'll see you next time. Thank you.